वीडियो एंड्स दैट द क्यू फॉर वेबिनार टू स्टार्ट पहले आप वो डाल दो ना अभी लाइव कर रहे हो तो जो फ्लायर है है आपके पास सर मेरे पास वो उनका वीडियो है जायस का मैं वो चलाऊंगा पहले नहीं नहीं अभी फ्लायर को ऑन कर दो ना फिर वीडियो ऑन कर सर फिर मैं शेयर नहीं कर पाऊंगा ये किसका है ये मेरा है आई विल स्टॉप शेयरिंग एज़ सुन एज़ वीडियो स्टॉप सो आई आई एम जस्ट मेकिंग लाइव मैम हां लाइव कर देना ये स्टॉप करेंगे फिर वीडियो चलाना आप मैम
welcome uh, everyone uh, good evening everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar this symposium on uh, mastering the science of refractive cataract surgery and achieving clinical success uh, this uh, uh, is primarily going to deal with the trifocal uh, iur technology and this is being sponsored by uh, zeiss uh, with this i'll just uh, pass on to uh, dr namrata for a brief introduction and then we can start with the session uh, it welcome everybody uh, the speakers and the delegates who are watching us on facebook youtube as well as on, on our uh, uh, web platform and we have a galaxy of speakers with us today uh, dr kk mehta uh, uh, who's the uh, surgical director in chief of the peta international eye institute mumbai dr d ramamurthy the past president of aios and chairman of the eye foundation coimbatore dr krishna prasad kudlu the scientific committee uh, member aios co-founder and managing director of Prasad Netrale Udupi, Dr. Gaurav Dutra, the medical director in Drishti Eye Institute, Dehradun, Dr. Sri Ganesh, chairman and managing director of Nitra Dhamma Hospital, uh, Private Limited at uh, Bangalore, Dr. Rohit Om Prakash, chairman of Dr. Om Prakash Eye Institute uh, from Amritsar, and Dr. Narain Shetty, the head of the Department of Cataract and Refractive Surgery, and the vice president of the Narayan Netrale Bangalore. Uh, Dr. Sartaj Greval, the consultant for cataract and refractive uh, surgery services at the Greval Eye Institute. Now, with this, uh, we would uh, move to the first talk, which is going to be given by Dr. Sartaj Greval. And uh, he is going to be talking about understanding the science behind the design of the trifocal intraocular lens. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I hope you can see my screen clearly. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So good evening. I would like to thank AIS and Professor Maripal Sustay with Professor Namrata Sharma for this opportunity. Today, my goal is to help explain the science behind the design of trifocal eye uh, In my presentation today, I will start by discussing the basics of diffractive optics then explain their application in bifocal eyewells, then look at the evolution of optics from bifocal to trifocal eyewells, and finally discuss some of the unique properties of the atd trifocal eyewell. In 1821, Augustine Fresnel, an engineer in the French army, developed a lens to help improve the visibility of lighthouses. Named after him, the Fresnel optic was a lens with some parallel blocks of glass removed, and it could collect most of the lamp's light and focus it towards the horizon. Diffractive eyewells it used today are a distant derivation from the same principle of Fresnel optics. Diffraction refers to various phenomena which occur when a wave encounters an obstacle or a slit. Due to diffraction, when we try to pass light through a very small hole, we will notice that it actually does not go in a straight line, but rather spreads out. The Huygens Fresnel principle states that every point of a wavefront can be thought of as being its own source of secondary so-called wavelets, subsequently spreading in a spherical distribution. Basically, this means that the planar wave is transformed into spherical waves after diffraction. Now, the light waves incident on two slits will spread out and exhibit an interference pattern in the region beyond. Interference is the combination of two or more waves to form a composite wave. Interference can be destructive or constructive. Disruptive interference occurs when two waves have an opposite phase relation and effectively cancel each other out. And constructive interference is when two waves are in parallel phase relation and the resultant wave has twice the amplitude of each of the original waves. During diffraction, the first bright image occurring to either side is called the first order diffraction. So in diffractive multifocal eyewells, near vision is the result of the first orders of diffraction that are produced as a result of constructive interference, produced as the waves spread beyond the IOL. A diffractive presbyopia correcting IOL is simply a combination of a normal monofocal optic correcting for distance and a diffractive element providing addition for near. The diffractive element consists of numerous prism shaped steps of varying width and height. The width of these steps helps determine the power of addition. The narrower the diffractive step, the greater the near addition. The wider the diffractive step, the lower the near addition. The width of these steps can be altered to choose between correction for near or intermediate vision. 
The height of the diffractive steps governs the modulation of light energy and essentially the orders of diffraction produced. Most bifocal IOLs distribute light such that 40% of light is directed towards infinity, 40% for near vision, and the remaining 20% is diffracted towards higher orders. And it is this 20% of light going towards higher orders of diffraction that is responsible for photic phenomena such as glare and halo experienced with these lenses. And since the second order diffraction would result in a near add of over six diopters, it would be too high to be clinically useful. By doubling the width of the steps, the power of addition for the first and second order could be half, resulting in first and second order adds of 1.66 and 3.33 diopters respectively. And these powers would be very useful clinically for patients. However, the light energy would be only 4%, making the images too dim to be useful. So if we create two different diffractive optics, where the respective first orders provide near and intermediate vision separately, and adjust the height of the steps so that light energy is optimally distributed, and then combine the two diffractive elements, you would actually have a trifocal IOL that corrects for near, intermediate, and distance, and with light energy distribution that makes the vision comfortable at all these distances. So when compared to a bifocal IOL, which provided only two foci at near and distance, we now have a lens that provides three clear foci for distance, intermediate, and near vision, greatly reducing the dependence on glasses. So a trifocal lens simultaneously focuses light for distance, intermediate, and near. And when implanted inside the eye, images from all three foci are being simultaneously displayed on the retina. Whenever there are multiple superimposed images on the retina, the brain always selects the clearer image and suppresses the blurred ones. This is, uh, the process of this is called neuroadaptation. The AT Lisa trifocal IOL is a hydrophilic lens with a hydrophobic surface with plate haptics. It has a six millimeter optic and a six millimeter diffractive zone. It has a near add of 3.33 diopters and an intermediate add of 1.66 diopters. It utilizes the zeroth, first, and second orders of diffraction and also has an aspheric surface to help counter the corneal aspheticity. Phase shifting zones are the junction between two adjacent diffractive steps. And through a unique manufacturing process, the phase zones in the AT visa are machined such that they do not have any right angles, significantly help reduce light scattering. The lens achieves very good light transmittance of 85.7% at all pupil sizes, helping improve contrast sensitivity. The AT lisa is a refractive diffractive IOL, where out of the total six millimeter diffractive zone, only the central 4.32 millimeter are trifocal and the outer two millimeter region of the lens sends light to the far and near foci exclusively. So in scotopic situations where an apodized bifocal IOL would begin to lose out on near vision, the AT Lisa loses out on intermediate vision, but still doesn't compromise near vision. The lens distributes 50% of light for distance, 20% for intermediate vision, and 30% for near. And as already discussed earlier, the distribution for intermediate vision falls once the pupil enlarges beyond 4.3 millimeters. This graph shows that at a wide range of pupil sizes from three to five and a half millimeters, the lens still continues to provide three distinct focal points. Even trifocals with convoluted surfaces where the steps are rounded and smoothened, there is a fall in both near and intermediate vision with increasing pupil sizes. And as mentioned earlier, unlike with an apodized surface, the AT Lisa's symmetric light distribution preserves near vision with increasing pupil size. Trifocals should be considered the lens of choice for all patients seeking independence from glasses after cataract surgery. And in the future, with further innovation in the design of the diffractive steps, as well as the manufacturing process of such eyewells, we can expect an even greater range of vision, improved contrast sensitivity, and minimal photic phenomena. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sartaj, for an excellent presentation. And in the same uh, vein, in the same context, let us go on to Dr. Ramamurthy, who is the chairman of Eye Foundation, a proficient uh, cataract refractive surgeon and trained also in VR. Uh, he's also going to talk about the uh, 
uh, evolution of tri trifocal IOL technology as to how it has evolved. Over to Dr. Ramamurthy, please. And Thank you, Dr. Mai. Question. The Should I start? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Mahipal, Dr. Namrata, and Zais for involving me in this uh, webinar. I think it's going to be a very educative evening. My premise is to cover evolution of trifocal IOL technology. I think Sataj has given a beautiful introduction. Uh, today, we know that cataract outcomes expectations have completely changed. No longer is uh, it consists of just vision restoration where we remove an opacity, but it is also considered as an avenue to enhance the vision to restore the vision to the patient better than what he or she enjoyed right through their lifetime. It's uncorrected visual activity, not just for distance, but for near and intermediate also. And quality of vision is extremely important. And what we are concerned about is what the patient is going to enjoy on the next post-operative day. And since we are operating on patients in their 40s and 50s and they are living into their well into their 80s, what we do today must power outlive our own professional lifetime. So it's a great responsibility that we have towards our patients. I've always felt a twinge of anxiety, a twinge of disappointment in patients whenever I prescribe glasses. Whether it's a 10-year-old getting his first myopic glasses, a 45-year-old getting his presbyopic glasses, or a 65-year-old after his cataract surgery being prescribed glasses for near vision, even though he might have just received a PMM lenses. So spectacle independence translates to a certain amount of inadequacy as far as present day ophthalmology is concerned. And obviously, in today's world, you would not prescribe glasses without correcting presbyopia or astigmatism. So, why leave behind presbyopia and astigmatism uncorrected in the commonest surgery performed in the human body, that of cataract surgery? So, obviously, if the patients were aware of it, they would always demand that their presbyopia and astigmatism is taken care of. But though we have been talking about it for more than two and a half decades about multifocal intraocular lenses, still, as you would see in my subsequent slides, the usage is much, much, much less than what it should be desired. It's essentially because we have not been so sure about the technology of these intraocular lenses. Cost is definitely a factor, but that's definitely not the only factor because for the limited usage. Obviously, if I was given a choice, I would like to see at all distances, near intermediate distance, it would be wonderful if we had an accommodative lens which could function like a normal uh, lens of the human eye. But obviously, we are still not there, so we have to settle for compromises. So when we had this diffractive lenses of plus four diopter rad, which was the initial uh, lenses, obviously refractive lenses are hardly there now. Uh, it used to offer excellent near vision, but the patients had to hold the books almost at 25, 30 centimeters. Then came the concept of low ad multifocals, then uh, eat off lenses, where, which are good for intermediate vision, but were quite inadequate for near vision. That's the reason that we have used to have significant conversation about mix and match, about monovision, about micro monovision, about blended vision, etc. Our patients were expected to decide what is important for them, whether it's near vision that's important for them, whether it's intermediate vision that's important for them, implant in one eye and then titrate the power of the lens that being implanted in the second day, etc. So obviously that is something that some patients and some many physicians they are not willing to accept. Then again, now we realize that it's not the quantity of vision that's important, but it's the quality of vision which is much more important. Today we don't talk about 6362 vision, but we are concerned about the quality of vision. And whatever multifocal intraocular lens that you are talking about, all of them work on the principle of splitting light. And depending upon which company's slides you are using, there would always be a certain amount of loss in contrast, especially in night vision conditions like this. It's simply because multifocality, either in the cornea or in the lens, is non-physiological. We have, as physicians, we have always felt that when we imitate nature, do something to restore physiology, we are successful. In the sense that if uh, there is an opacity, there's a cataract, we remove it. If blood pressure goes up, we reduce it. If intraocular pressure goes up, we reduce it. Uh, multifocality was never in the concept of nature and that's the reason that when we divide light and artificially expect the patients to adapt to it, there is a certain amount of uh, inconvenience, there's a certain amount of discomfort that creeps in. Sartaj already explained about this concept. Basically, when you are using multifocal intraocular lenses, you are buying vision at different distances using the currency of contrast and there is always a certain amount of loss in contrast. 
these are the rays of light which are brought, brought into focus in, in front. This is from the near focus, this is from the distance focus. And in case the patient is looking at a distance object, these rays of light are going to diverge and form a blurred image. So this is the signal which is the advantages, which is uh, responsible for the visual acuity of the patient, while this is the noise which deteriorates the quality of vision. As was explained earlier, they, with the conventional diffractive lenses, 80 to 82% of the light, what constituted the signal, while 18% of light was constituting the noise. Today with multifocal, with the trifocal technology, because of diffractive optics that's incorporated in this, 86 to 88% of light is used for producing the signal. It is not the increase in 4 to 6% of light, but the fact that Instead of 18% of light constituting the noise, it's been reduced to 12%. And that's the reason there's an inherent capability to improve the quality of vision with the trifocal and trifocal lenses compared to the diffractive multifocals. Again, the, today with the AT Lisa trifocal, we have this division of light, which seems to be optimal because most important to us is the distance vision. 50% of the light goes towards distance. 20% which is for intermediate and for 30% for near vision. And this defocus curve tells me all, I, all that I need to know in the sense that right from infinity to a defocus of almost minus 2.5 diopters, when you implant a trifocal and hit uh, emetropia, then you get a vision of about 0 0.00 to 0 0.10 logma visual acuity which even if unilaterally implanted or bilaterally implanted, almost mimics what the patient to need in their real life conditions. And that's the reason there's so much of interest and in uptake of multi trifocal intraocular lenses. These trifocal intraocular lenses, though we have incorporated in our practice for quite recently, they have been around for quite some time. The first lenses came almost a decade back. The Carl Zeiss introduced it about eight years back and quite rightfully, they introduced the AT Lisa Toric just a year later. Obviously, today all of us understand that no multifocal intraocular lens is going to uh, work well unless it has the inherent capability to uh, correct corneal astigmatism. If you leave behind corneal astigmatism uncorrected, then obviously the multifocal intraocular lens patient is going to be quite unhappy. There followed panoptics intraocular lenses, panoptics toric, etc. The good news is that we have the freedom of choice to pick and choose what exactly our patients need and what we are most comfortable with. The Indian manufacturers have also come up with trifocal intraocular lenses, quite a few of them which are good. And today, we owe it to our patients to incorporate this in our technology. But is this what is happening? Let's look at the total amount of cataract procedures done in India. It's about 7.5 millions. This is, equal, this is more than what is being done in United States, China, and most of Western Europe put together. And the good news is it's growing at the rate of 3 to 4 percentage. And the PMMA intraoc lenses, rightfully, where the large incision is needed, is just in about one-fifth of the cases. With four-fifth of the cases getting monofocal foldable intraoc lenses. And uh, still, still hydrophilic lenses are largely implanted in almost three-fifths of the cases. What is more relevant to today's discussion is maybe this slide, where, according to the last year's statistics, the trifocal intraoc, the toric intraoc lenses were just about a lakh and 40,000 intraoc lenses that were implanted. But the good news is that all ophthalmologists are realizing the importance of correcting cylinders. And unlike the uh, phaco emulsification or cataract surgery, which is growing at the rate of 3 to 4 percentage, the increase in the uptake of toric intraoc lenses is almost six times more. As far as multifocal intraoc lenses are concerned, it's 110,000, as growing at the rate of multifocal uh, 17 percent. So obviously, in the Indian ophthalmology, the interest in multifocals, toric, as well as toric multifocals, is constantly on the rise, and rightfully so. If you look at the sale of trifocal intraocular lenses, it was just about seven to 8,000 last year. Obviously, with the amount of interest that's surfacing, this number would have uh, gone up exponentially in 2020, but for this uh, uh, disturbance put in by COVID. But I'm sure, in spite of with, will jump back and trifocals will come to stay. So 0.1%, uh, not just of cataract surgery, but of the entire foldable market constitutes trifocal intraocular lenses. And I believe that we owe it to our patients and ourselves to increase this quite significantly. What exactly are the uh, barriers to the uptake of these trifocals or for that matter, multifocal intraocular lenses, multiple webinars, multiple presentations, uh, many of them very good. 
and it often leaves behind an impression that you need optical biometry, you need topography, you need great evaluation of the tear film, abrometry, high-end FACO machine, LRCS, advanced microscopes, digital imaging during surgery so that you can orient your lenses exactly to go ahead and uptake uh, uh, trifocals. I would beg to differ. I have all this access to all this technology. I use them extensively. I do believe that they are relevant, but obviously it's not necessary for you to go ahead and incorporate trifocals in your uh, armamentarium. I have multiple centers and there are centers where we do not have all this technology. And still I encourage my surgeons, quite often excellent cataract surgeons to go ahead and use multifocals and torics and they are adapting to it. So good immersion A scan, a standard manual auto or auto keratometry is quite adequate. The difference between manual keratometry and immersion A scan and optical biometry is that optical biometry is idiot proof. You could, in a normal eye, you could go, go ahead and have a relatively inexperienced optometrist doing it, and still you could go ahead and get reasonably good results. But in case you have perfected your technique of immersion A scan keratometry, it's, uh, whether it's being done by an ophthalmologist or by an experienced optometrist, it's possible to get excellent uh, uh, refractive outcomes, at least in the normal eyes. Again, standard formula like the Barrett Universal suit has become available. And this is available right in the uh, ACRS, APACRS websites. You don't need complex equipments to calculate these. And the company calculators based incorporating this formula are also quite reliable. So all you need is good FACO techniques where you can give predictive, uh, predictable refractive outcomes. And you should under understand the importance of corneal astigmatism. Again, the, the understanding the capabilities and limitations of these modern intraocular lenses and counseling your patients ex uh, accordingly is extremely important. Just to give you an example, these are the eyes of a patient bilaterally done in our, in our own institute. Obviously, this lens is decentered, while this, as you can see in the diffractive rings, is very well centered. This kind of decentration, the level on diffractive multifocals, even with uh, monofocals, would uh, cause significant amount of coma and uh, trifoil. And obviously, you can't blame the lens for deterioration in the quality of uh, uh, vision. When you dilate the pupil and see the reason why this has happened is there has been a rexis runoff and there has been a displacement of the lens. So as far as you can avoid this, which is obviously possible with a person who is well-trained in FACO emulsification, who is confident of his outcomes, I think whether it's trifocals or torics, it's uh, something that you can always take on. Uh, Pre-operative workflow will be subsequently dealt with, but just a slide on this because it's relevant to what we do in our own setup. Presence of cataract and interested in surgery if the patient expresses an interest in undergoing cataract surgery. We make sure there's no significant ocular or systemic comorbidities by the tests that are relevant. Then the patient straight away go for an optical or biometry or a keratometry, even more than immersion A scan, it's keratometry, which is important for that. Subsequently, the surgeon or the counselor talks to them about uh, elicits their interest in premium intraocular lenses. And in case they're interested, then we go ahead and then uh, counsel them for toric trifocals or trifocal toric. Today, we have st virtually stopped talking about EDOF lenses or about uh, bifocal lenses. I use them ex extensively, had a wonderful experience with them. But today's world, I believe that trifocals are the way to go. And the reason for that, as I already alluded to, they take care of all distances and the patients are not requested to pick and choose as what is needed for them. Uh, the most important factor, again, is to decide as what exactly is important for the patient and restrict the conversation to that. If you start from right from PMMA and go on to trifocal toric with the LRCS technology, the patient is going to listen to all of it and go elsewhere for surgery. So within a few minutes of interaction with the patient, we decide whether the patient is a good candidate for my, uh, premium intraocular lens technology, what's the kind of corneal astigmatism that the patient has. Then the subsequent uh, interaction is all about what is best for the patient. And most importantly, you it's uh, important, it's ethical for you to tell the demerits of the lenses, tell all the positives and negatives. But most often, the patient accepts your suggestion. They want you to make the decision for them. So it's important that you understand the requirements of that particular patient and accordingly suggest what is what is correct for them. I believe there is an opportunity for us to try, take on trifocals in a great way from its present 0.1% of the um, uh, of the foldable intraocular lenses. 
is because there is a change in patient lifestyle the patients are living into the 80s and 90s they are still at this age group they are involved in sports they are very active they want to drive on their own there is improved awareness of general health and eye diseases among patients and they are willing to pay for an advanced technology procedures by patients we might think 1 lakh for a cataract surgery is it right to uh, demand this of a patient but obviously nowadays that's what it costs a patient to get a appendix removed in a corporate hospital so obviously for their vision they can afford to pay this kind of uh, at least a certain section of the population can afford to pay this kind of a price and increase in access to advanced technology to, to more and more ophthalmologists look at the number of webinars so many youngsters middle aged people have the kind of interest that indian ophthalmology is evincing towards modern technology is unparalleled and this is the right time to offer the best of technology to our patients every opportunity comes with challenges and what are the challenges that we have in incorporating trifocal intraocular lenses the surgeon confidence in offering multifocal intraocular lenses usually because of one or two patients who have been dissatisfied with their multifocal intraocular and have taken up much of the chat time often forgotten is that 98% of the patients who have been very happy with their quality of vision they enjoy subsequent to multifocal or trifocal implantation and then the fact that the, the these lenses are slightly significantly highly priced is again a factor often i come across patients who have to do decide between multifocal intraocular lenses and lrcs they are not able to um, adapt both of them in those cases i strongly recommend them to go ahead with a multifocal intraocular lens or multifocal toric lens because that i feel that that offers more value for money to these patients than spending money on lrcs technology i am all for laser refractive cataract surgery but when it comes to outcomes obviously the quality of lens that you implant is much more important than phaco emulsification or lrcs this is a study which was conducted by alcon in the year 2017 i mean coming to the last couple of my slides and this was called the go to see campaign though it was conducted by alcon this is relevant to all of us who are practicing ophthalmology today 12 countries in europe middle east and asia africa were covered basically the patients surveyed were above the age of 60 years only 39% of the patients were aware that cataract surgery can offer vision correction in the sense that the patients if they were wearing Minus six diopters of power. They believe that after cataract surgery, also they would like they are li likely to be left with that kind of power. They never under realize that the, uh, most often once the intraocular lens of the right power is uh, implanted in the eyes, the need for glasses is going to diminish. Again, eighty-two percent of the patients were willing to undergo advanced surgical option, paying out of the pocket to treat the cataract and improve their vision. So, if only we take out time. we explain to them that these lenses are going to be significantly advantageous to you of course there is a price to pay then many of your patients are going to come around and adapt this technology so obviously we as surgeons of the third millennium go to our patients to uh, um, give adequate information to them this does not mean that once you have the trifocal intraocular lenses you can forget all about the counseling that has been drilled into our heads about multifocal intraocular lenses even today we talk about less dependence on glasses dysphotopsia is definitely something to be considered bilateral surgery with a space between the two eyes is what we recommend touch up procedures may be needed and neural adaptation is something that uh, the patients have to live with 4 to 6 months might take for them to really adapt uh, to their intraocular lenses the final slide i think trifocal technology has come of age and you should not be the first one to adapt technology neither be the last one you owe it to yourselves you owe it to your patients to go ahead and adapt them thank you so much for your kind attention thank you very much uh, dr ramamurthy for an excellent presentation i think uh, one of the base problems is that uh, the trifocal technology or the premium lens technology or even the lscrs is not covered by the insurance um, in majority of the countries i think that is until of course we make a toric lens available as also a, a premium lens is available in the mediclaim or the insurance policies uh, there is going to be some issue where the patient has to pay out of pocket but i think what you have uh, rightly said is that the patient education is something which is very very important but also what has been key which uh, i think both uh, you and sataj have pointed out is that the technology of the trifocals has improved very significantly wherein uh, the light transmission is very good as also there is intermediate vision as also the incidence of dysphotopsia has gone down 
and therefore uh, i think uh, the adopt uh, the people who are adapting i can say even about my own personal self that uh, i was never ever comfortable to that extent whenever we were having the bifocal lenses and as you rightly said mix and match do this that wherever there are ifs and buts that's a problem so i think uh, uh, with the newer technologies that are coming in uh, the penetration for the trifocal lenses has improved and i think all the companies are going towards trifocal and i think in the market there are at least 7 8 companies or maybe 10 12 companies which have the trifocal lenses that are available uh, any uh, any comments uh, do you feel do you feel that if there is a reimbursement that is there uh, that could increase the penetration of these premium lenses to a large extent i think definitely so i mean uh, you know the cost is definitely a consideration and uh, now nowadays there are some insurance companies some uh, uh, corporate insurance which do cover for multifocal and trifocal lenses and these patients are very comfortable taking up these lenses and as i already mentioned if it's a question of choosing between elasis technology and for between uh, trifocals i would always any day go for trifocals because i think that gives them more bang for the buck uh, i think a comment on that majority of my patients who go in for uh, a trifocal are those who go in for an lscrs also so that is no no i agree either, either either that's true i mean whenever yeah. a patient those patients who are going for lscs often they are at a point where price is not a major consideration mm -hmm. they want the best of technology both as far as the extractive technology as far as the, and mm -hmm. the intraocular lens yeah. is concerned But there are certain when you have to implant a trifocal toric intraocular lens add on the lscs also then uh, and uh, suggest bilateral surgery it becomes fairly expensive for them in those cases i am talking about when they have to pick and choose maybe i would recommend that te uh, iol technology yeah narain you wanted to make a point uh, yes sir actually uh, totally agree sir like if the insurance actually are uh, uh, you know uh, also in the same uh, basket i think uh, definitely lot more people will come Uh, more than reimbursement in our hospital, we have seen that patients are more keen on cashless surgery. Uh, cashless surgeries. So if if really insurance companies get into, I mean, you know, I feel the Zeiss uh, or any all the big companies actually they should go and target, you know, uh, uh, these big uh, IT companies and this which have a large number of insurance uh, cover. and talk to them and try to you know include all these multifocal iols and it's not like a partial cover it should be like a complete cashless uh, cashless uh, surgery so that way you know a lot of patients will 100% opt for it if it is cashless definitely no i think that's very true narain i already see it happening in our center in bangalore quite a few pay i am sure those of you in bigger cities might also be experiencing it and uh, i find that uh, there are quite a few corporate insurance which is started covering it maybe all these uh, companies should get together and make uh, the patients understand the benefits of them and make it a norm that multifocals are covered so that would definitely increase the uptake of these lenses uh actually uh, just to bring it on record i think there is one government that has uh, uh, that has uh, now approved lscrs uh, not trifocal surgery and that is the haryana government the haryana government has approved both the uh, uh, femto cataract as also the femto lasik for their employees so that is uh, i think a, a first beginning that we have got i don't know whether any other state or cghs they have not none of them have approved and uh, as far as the government i don't think any one of them they have put a limit on the iol capping is there and they they don't do the trifocals or the torics etc but i think maybe from the aios side we can also make a representation to have these things uh, considered because uh, there is an opening that is there in haryana government that is there so maybe in karnataka or tamil nadu or maharashtra or chandigarh or whatever i think uh, uh, or punjab we can uh, punjab and i think if haryana as punjab should be able to do it i think to try to represent and get this but at least lscrs is something that has been approved and uh, the trifocals also need to be approved that the only problem new technology comes the prices go very high uh the, so just now uh, even though uh, we are on a size plan clearance so or whatever it is for the trifocal i think uh, they are uh, uh, lenses which are pretty good and uh, i have used more than 500 of these trifocal lenses uh, personally i don't know what is the penetration uh, as regards uh, trifocals in uh, the government institution maybe namrata you can uh, Uh, tell about that, but uh, I have not seen the penetration of 
प्रीमियम आईओएल्स और प्रीमियम सर्जरीज गो डाउन पोस्ट कोविड और एज वी आर इन द कोविड इवन टुडे आई हैड टुडे 12 कैटरैक्ट्स एंड आउट ऑफ विच 11 वर फेम्टोस सो आई रियली डोंट नो वन ऑफ देयर देयर इज नो पेरेंट देयर वर आई थिंक फोर ट्राइफोकल्स आउट ऑफ देम सो द पेनिट्रेशन इज स्टिल गुड आई डोंट नो हाउ इट इज इन द गवर्नमेंट इंस्टीट्यूशंस सर इन द गवर्नमेंट इंस्टीट्यूशंस आल्सो इट इज गुड स्पेशली दोस पीपल who are able to uh, get their reimbursements and even some people are willing to pay out of their pockets also so it has definitely increased over a period of time at least in the last couple of years although earlier it was when we were at bifocal level it was not that much but ever since the newer ones have newer generation have come also the edof lenses and the trifocals all of them toric i was of course now it's like 100% uh, all uh, everybody is using it right left and center no one any astigmatism to be left uncorrected but uh, over the last couple of years it has uh, it has taken a front seat i also think <laughs> second eyes are coming in now uh, the second eyes also uh, would add to the numbers because uh, whenever you earlier have a first eye a lot of us want to prefer to get the second eye of the patient done fast but i think there will be second eyes which will increase the numbers Uh, yes ram one final comment and then yeah. we can so, it all depends on you know reimbursement for example in the, in australia toric eyes there's full reimbursement and 85% yeah. of the patients get toric intraocular lenses even for yeah. a 0.75 yeah. diopters they go ahead and implant correct the cylinder obviously uh, you know you won't prescribe glasses without correcting cylinder so the same argument holds good so whenever there is a reimbursement uh, the uh, numbers are likely to go up there is one question which has come on the uh, web platform and that is can we use trifocals in pediatric age group i personally have you know i used to use multifocal intraocular lenses and then uh, uh, not a, in large numbers not in the real under 5 age group the lowest i have implanted is 6 years old and very recently i implanted a one 10 year old child uh, trifocals in both eyes one eye actually i implanted trifocal toric and uh, well i mean uh, the basic uh, whatever principles you follow for pediatric cataract surgery was followed and uh, the results are quite good i i did it almost a year back uh, and it's not a very large experience but then i don't see any downside to it i think going ahead and prescribing a presbyopic glasses in a child whose visual uh, eyeballs have almost matured uh, i think it's uh, not right and the adaptation the neural adaptation in pediatric age group is much more easier much better than what we see in adults thank you uh, dr kegi you wanted to make a comment and then we go on to goro's presentation i always fit trifocals in pediatric cases i've been fitting bifocal since i, I don't know about 20 years 25 years now i won the best award for trifocal at the at the scrs conference also i personally believe that children adapt onto trifocals very easily and at a later stage when they cross the age of 16 or 17 you can always polish it off at later later stage if required but the point remains that children are happy they can manage comfortably in the school they don't have to walk around wearing bifocals it makes them the butt of jokes for everybody else and i still cannot understand why it is not done as a routine in all cases Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kegi, and uh, we go on to the next speaker. I think getting a perfection in the calculation of the IOL is something very, very important because when you are looking at uh, the trifocals or the premium IOLs, uh, getting uh, getting the target right uh, is something very, very important. We have none other than uh, Dr. Gaurav Luthra, who is a, a great surgeon, a great anterior segment surgeon, but above all, a fantastic human being. and uh, he is uh, always uh, keen on technology and i think he has the best uh, sense uh, and knowledge on um, the uh, iol power calculations getting it right the formulas etc etc so dr gaurav luthra from uh, dehradun he'll be talking about uh, uh, the iol power calculations and getting it right thanks a lot uh, dr maipal sir dr namrata and uh, thank you so much for inviting me for sharing this uh, you know passion of mine uh, i'll quickly share my screen so okay so i'll be speaking on uh, biometric considerations in achieving uh, refractive predictability in premium iols and uh, i have no financial interest and as we are all aware that uh, 
patients' expectations have grown. And uh, we have now uh, the era of the refractive cataract surgery, as we have seen over the last two lectures as well. And excellent outcomes with laser refractive surgery have raised the bar for cataract surgeons as well. And uh, hard selling of freedom from glasses or throw away from throw away or spectacles by our refractive fraternity may be uh, another reason. So in fact, and it's not unfounded, everybody would love to be free of glasses if they can, and if, if they can get a quality outcome. So there is no question left on that as well. And success with premium eyes, it largely depends upon near perfect refractive outcomes. And uh, residual refractive error is the primary cause for a dissatisfied premium eye patient. So I think before we start looking at lots of other things, it would be important that uh, we ensure that we have a great refractive result. And that's what my talk is all about. So precise and predictable preoperative measurements and accurate biometry are the key to achieving near emetropia and a satisfied patient. Of course, there's much more to it than just biometry, but I think this is the key to success as well. Measurements for premium miles can be dependent on multiple factors. So precise preoperative measurements, a role of advanced technologies to help the clinician do better and beyond biometry. And understanding the importance, understanding this uh, of the importance lays the foundation of a successful premium malpractice. So I think a premium malpractice requires working on, and it does not come automatically. And you have to really uh, work at it because a high-powered lens that is only 0.1 millimeter forward in the capsular pack can cause almost a one doctor refractive error. So the scope for error is very small, and uh, satisfied patients will bring you satisfied other uh, potential patients as well. So when it comes to diagnostic instruments, uh, when you're dealing with a patient for biometry, you could be looking at many things today, uh, right from uh, a corneal topographer to optical or immersion biometry, manual keratometries to an OCT uh, to look at the fovea. If you're looking for a premium mild patient, uh, you could be doing tomography in certain cases. And today, actually, a tear film assessment also becomes really important. So uh, the considerations for premium mild patients are many. Uh, K readings from multiple instruments, I'll talk about it just now. Check if there are inconsistencies due to, due to the poor ocular surface, as I just mentioned before. A good patient history and the profession of the patient is very, very important. So when we do a biometry and when we first meet the patient, I always spend one minute talking to the patient about what he does and what he's looking for, what kind of glasses he uses, what are his hobbies. I think that is very important. Uh, in addition to biometry, for you to decide what kind of eye will to choose, what kind of post refractive outcome to choose as well. Uh, we would love to exclude patients with unrealistic expectations, but I think the number of patients that you exclude has gone down drastically with improvements in technology and our understanding. And uh, of course, the patient should understand the potential possibilities of side effects. It's always good to mention about possibility of occasional glare and halos, which I always do uh, to the patient. Also good to tell them that this we are not going to be 100% sure that you're going to be completely free of glasses. I always mention to them that you'll be mostly free of glasses. You may have to use, use some glasses for occasional things like fine print reading or uh, when driving so that that builds up the right expectations for the patient. Today, it's very important to also ask for previous history of any refractive surgery. You, you'll be surprised. There are so many patients who actually have undergone refractive surgery and you could miss some of them with a the small uh, you know, correction which was done and you could uh, be sitting with a refractive surprise. So biometry has come a long way from the time we used to use the javel shirts or the Bosch and Lomb uh, keratometers and the ultrasounds, which evolved a lot, but then we came to the optical biometries, which came in almost 10, 15 years back. And today we've come to a stage where optical biometries have become tremendously better than what we were even five years back. So prerequisites for a good biometry, a good keratometry, which includes both the magnitude of astigmatism and the axis, because today we do a lot of torics, the axial length, the AC depth, the lens thickness, and the effective lens position. Now, the good thing is all these can be done by an optical biometer very nicely and in one shot. And as Dr. Ramamurthy said, while it is not essential to have an optical biometer, but it's highly recommended definitely to have one. But let that not stop you from going on to trifocal lenses. So we, we've come a long way from what we did with keratometries coming to the ocular surface. I think uh, a good look at the slit lamp is very important. And some, some centers actually do a default uh, uh, you know, tear film analysis and uh, ocular surface analysis, but that's not absolutely necessary. But a good clinical exam is definitely important to make sure that you get a perfect uh, uh, biometry as well. And then also, it's always great to do the biometry as uh, on a virgin eye without installation of any drops, without using the non-contact tonometer. Otherwise, you can have problems. 
so with, with the old biometers as you can see we used to have measurements done and we would be very good with power difference or the magnitude of astigmatism but these keratometers are not great when picking the steep meridian if you are planning to do toric iols you would have to be very very meticulous if you are using a manual keratometer but definitely for biometry uh, for getting the iol power right you could you still use these case definitely for getting the axis right i think there's nothing better than a placido based uh, topography it's not essential again and uh, much of the new bio optical biometers do a great job of getting the axis right as well but when in doubt it's always great to go back to a topographer and do a placido topography keratometry could have many errors um, if you are not uh, using a focused eyepiece failure to calibrate poor patient fixation a dry eye or a poor ocular surface and so many other things and irregular cornea optical biometry i think i think the key uh, that for us our premium mile practice you know it went up uh, about 10 years back when we shifted to optical biometry and whenever one can afford one there is one should not think twice before switching you know i, I do keep hearing lectures that you know uh, if you are doing great immersion you don't need to go for optical now if you can afford it if, if your payer patients are ready to pay for it there should be nothing to stop you from going for it as well but doing an immersion is not something which you are going to doing wrong if you can't afford to get one for your practice one should not mind we've come a long way from the almaster 500 which was set the benchmark initially and then we started using the lensar with more markers for the keratometry and today the almaster 700 sets again the gold standards it has three zone keratometry telecentric keratometries has the new option which will come up soon of the placido as well or similar to placido they will be giving us uh, some kind of derived placido things and then of course the total k and that helps so telecentric keratometry essentially means that when you move the machine backwards and forwards to focus you can have the dots you know moving away or far so with the almaster 700 that takes care of that which i don't think um, any of the others uh, biometry biometers do i don't know how much difference it will make drastic whether it will make a drastic difference but this is what uh, the company would make us believe at least and i'm sure it has some scientific basis to it then the total keratometry which again has uh, you know a lot of uh, new advantages and proposed advantages as well because uh, the it measures the posterior corneal surface and that helps derive the total keratometry and uh, while most other devices would only choose the anterior cornea uh, which uh, you know which would not and they use nomograms uh, with all the formulas like the barrett's uh, universal 2 and the barrett's toric calculator where uh, they use Uh, nomograms to assess uh, to incorporate the posterior corneal astigmatism so total k is derived like this i will not go into the details but it helps in uh, you know giving you values which can be replaced in most of the formulas except the barrett's because barrett's already has a nomogram inbuilt into it so you could use it with all these formulas here and uh, the hoffer q and all these you can replace the total k into these as well and it's compatible whereas uh, if you're using the barrett suite then of course uh, you know you would have the separate barrett's total k universal and the barrett's total k toric formulas for that now when you're doing toric iols and especially if you're doing trifocals i think the the threshold for switching to toric is very small for me if i have even small astigmatisms i will always do a calculation for my trifocals and see if they need a toric because outcomes will not be great if you are leaving uncorrected astigmatism or sometimes i will even do a femto lri if there is very small astigmatism so for pre pre operative corneal elasticmatism in toric iols the step one is to determine the orientation of the steep and the flat meridians and uh, measure the power difference between these two meridians so we should avoid the mindset that in toric iol what's needed is simply to get a set of k's and one has to actually put in a lot of thought into doing the keratometries and a lot of effort so what should you do i typically recommend that you you usually would have two or three devices in your clinic which can do the keratometries even if they are like an auto keratometer besides your optical biometer so get readings from two or three different devices and make sure that you have consistency between these measurements for the axis as well as the magnitude and if you're not getting consistency then try to look for the reason why you don't have a consistency if it's the poor ocular surface or if there is something else you can call the patient back once after improving the surface and then that would still help in getting a good uh, you know biometry so don't don't rest till you have found out why a reading is not consistent it could be a small terigium it could be a small corneal scar so once you've done that then you look for the triangle of agreement i think this is very important and i have taken this slide from warren hill uh, he typically recommends that for both the axis and the magnitude you should have a primary device so like for the axis of the steep meridian you can have a primary instrument which could be a placido if you have one otherwise it could be just your optical case and then you can go on to have a secondary device and a tertiary device which when you look for consistency if all of them are showing you the same readings for example here three devices have been used the primary device for us is obviously the placido 
but you can also use the IL master, which is very, very accurate. And then you can use something from the Pentacam. And if all three are showing similar axes, for example, here, it's the 83 here, 84 here, then you, you know, you're relaxed because you know that the, my axis is right. If you were using only one device and you got it wrong, you would go wrong completely and have a poor result. So it's always great to have two or three devices in your clinic, which can help you come with this. Similarly, for the magnitude of astigmatism, you can have a primary device like the Isle Master Keratometry. And for support, you could have something like an eye trace, or it could be so many other devices which you could use. You could have the Atlas, you could have a topographer, it could be your auto keratometer for that matter. But if they all look good, I use the Virion as well. So that would sometimes, you know, it helps. And so that gives you peace of mind that you have it right. And then you can go ahead with your toric calculations. Exit lens, of course, we've come a long way from the ultrasonic biometry, the contact methods. I used to use that uh, in the early 2000s and then uh, shifted on to immersion for a few years and then came to optical. Now, speaking about optical is a totally different topic, but what it does is it sets you free of, you know, it's, it's more objective and your operators can use it, even, uh, even the uh, immersion ones. But applination, I think, is a total no-no today. If anybody is still doing applination ultrasonic biometry, I think it's not acceptable and immersion is easily available on all devices and works beautifully well and can be trained to your technicians as well and is almost as good as optical biometry. So for the exit length, there is no reason why we should still stick to a contact method. And yes, optical biometry is the gold standard and you can see here why. For applanation, the scope of error is plus minus 0.24 millimeters. For immersion, it's plus minus 0.12 in the axial length and uh, an IL master or lens star will only give you 0 0.01. So obviously, axial length measurements are the key to biometry. And when you go wrong with those, you can get a refractive surprise. So the new uh, biometers which have come about, uh, the IL master 700 and a couple of others also as well, which have a swept source OCT scan, can do a great job because they can penetrate my very dense cataracts. And almost 99% of cataracts today can be penetrated. And they also have a fixation check which you can see here and that is basically for uh, you know the fovea and it tells you whether you got the readings right and if you didn't get it right you could you know you have a good uh, scan there uh, also uh, you know you can have uh, standard deviations on your measurements so it's more accurate and more repeatable measurements and you can cross check it. it it takes multiple scans and you can have differences in the scan standout and you can go repeat them so it always is important to look at these scans it's not great to always just look at the printout if you can sit for the for two minutes on the machine and look at the scans it usually helps a lot otherwise at least look at these standard deviations over here so the standard deviations will tell you if certain measurements are off significantly and then you can have them repeated similarly uh, you know here differences in excellence would be really small differences in case will be usually really small otherwise you could go back and repeat these as well the last frontier in biometry at least is the effective lens position and uh, almost all the new formulas they typically do use this and this was actually something which uh, has brought the biometry to the next level where almost plus minus 0.5 outcomes are seen in 90 percent of our surgery patients Something which I also like to do as well, I'll spend two, uh, two, two minutes on this, is the abrometry. This may not be available to everyone, and it is not necessary to do this, but if you have access to it, it helps when planning premium IOs and trifocal IOs. It's great to see that the you know corneal aberrations are not significant, and it's only the lens aberrations which are there. So if you have this, you can always have a look at that, and then this becomes a good case for doing a premium IOL. And of course, if you have high corneal aberrations, as in this patient, you can see over there that there are significant uh, corneal aberrations over here and the trefoil and the coma. So then obviously this patient may not be a great uh, patient for that. And then of course, you can always look at the angle alpha and the kappa for premium IELTS, the angle alpha, it is suggested should be less than 0.5, but there is still no sh uh, definite uh, thing on this. And many surgeons don't actually pay much attention to this. So angle alpha and kappa can be thought about and then of course the toric planning. And then it's good to have a quick look. If you have a placido in your clinic, uh, then there's no reason why you should not do it for a premium mild patient. Sometimes you'll have a pre inferior steepening. You may have a form of frustic keratoconus or an irregular cornea, and then you may be hit with a surprise and a dissatisfied premium mild patient. Now coming to very shortly to the formulas, they've come a long way as well. The first generation, the second generation, and the third generation. And today we are sitting on the fourth and the fifth generation formulas. Today, I think universally, uh, most people do tend to rely more on the Barrett's uh, Universal 2 or the Barrett's Suite and the Hill RBA formula, which has uh, artificial intelligence and a couple of new formulas like the Kane and the Super Larders, which are still coming up. But this uh, typically tells you how to choose between 
the formulas and you'll see here that at the bottom, these formulas, the new formulas that we use today have a huge range for the long eyes, for the average eyes and for the short eyes. So these are the two formulas which I tend to use as well, the Barrett's and the Hale RBF, and they've given us great results. Hale RBF uh, is artificial intelligence based. It's not a formula and it does not depend on the ELP. And it also tells you when an eye is out of bounds, which means if it has unusual measurements, uh, very long axial length with very short uh, AC depth or, or similar, it'll typically tell you that, you know, not to use these calculations and be on your guard. And it has uh, now dramatically increased the range of our long and short eyes and with much more eyes included. And it's possible to aim for residual refractive errors. The Barrett suite is where, you know, it's integrated in almost all the new uh, uh, the optical biometers, especially so with the Master 700 and which shows superior results to almost all the other formulas. And it does include uh, posterior surface of the cornea is also included in the Barrett suite. Uh, with the nomogram, and uh, it includes three formulas, the universal two for non-toric IOLs, the toric calculator, and the true K. And uh, you can use the Barrett suite on the most of these devices. But as Dr. Ramamurthy said, if you don't have an optical biometer, it's still available on the ASCRS and APSCRS sites. So the Barrett's two uses typically requires the axial length and the keratometry and the lens factor. Optional things are the AC depth and the white to white and the lens thickness and the design factor. Now, obviously, these four things on the right, they increase the accuracy of these formulas. So lens factor is derived from the SRKT constant. The design factor is, uh, is uh, it influences the IL calculation specifically and it is IL specific. And uh, without the DF calculation is possible for IELTS, but it is less precise. Without the white to white, AC depth and the lens thickness, the calculation obviously will not be as precise as you can get. So to increase accuracy, if you are using all these things into the formula, it obviously will give you better results. So uh, I will not go into the details of how it does this, but it has the option of utilizing all these five variables, which you can see at the bottom and as I've just discussed. So I, I think it, it goes a long way in giving, giving you excellent uh, results. And the performance has been proven to be great. And when it compares to the other formulas, I'll just show you how it has been shown to be much, much more accurate when used with optical biometers and specifically so with the IL Master 700. The Toric calculator for, uh, by Barrett has done a great job. We've done away with most of the other company-based formulas, uh, the calculators which we were using before. It incorporates for all the formulas and has inbuilt nomogram for posterior corneal astigmatism. So you don't need to make any of the adjustments. And... Uh, you don't need to use the Baylor's nomogram and it does a great job and I've shifted to this almost for the last five years. I don't use anything else. So please ensure that uh, you are using one of these formulas or a company-based formulas, which also incorporate the Barrett's uh, uh, you know, toric calculator as well. Post laser vision correction, I think, again, there's a huge leap. Uh, today, the Barrett's true K is what I trust a lot and it is based on the Barrett's universal too, but it takes uh, into measurement, it gives you the options of uh, choosing for post LASIK, hyperopic LASIK and PRK. And uh, it again has given great results, but I also use the Ascaris calculator for all my patients. Here you can feed in data from uh, various devices, including the Pentacam and the OCT, whatever you have. You don't have to feed in all of them, but whatever you have, you can feed those. And it will give you the different formulas, five or six. This is again free of cost available on the SRS site. And you can see here that I would choose the highest formula power, which was being picked up by most of these uh, formulas. And it really helps in using this. And uh, some of these post-attractive surgery patients, I do use the EKR report on the Pentacam as well. So I think trying to finish off uh, the TK formulas, which are there on the Almasa 700 have made life more easy because they can also pick up, uh, they can be useful in uh, eyes, corneas, which have been dealt with before, which are not virgin corneas. And that's where they play a big role because they measure, actually measure the posterior corneal surface and the new formulas by Barrett's, which are for TK can be used. I'm not sure, I'm, I'm not using this. So I'll leave it for discussion whether these are going to be there. Finally, we should always do an outcomes analysis. Otherwise, we will not know what we are doing. So it's very important. These refractive form must look at your refractive outcomes. Otherwise, you will not know what you're doing and you'll keep using the formulas, but you will not get anywhere. So as you can see here, these formulas are all good. The ray tracing, the Barrett's Universal and Hill, they all give about 90% accuracy for plus minus 0.5. And again, another comparison of uh, the same outcomes. And for us, we also do post-op evaluations for our patients for toric placements. We This is a very good device on the eye trace. Again, no financial interest, but I love using this. It tells you whether your toric is sitting in place and whether you need to rotate it. And it's great to check all your patients post-op for the access of implantation as well. And if you have a dissatisfied trifocal patient or a multifocal patient, you can look for other reasons for dissatisfaction, whether there's a decentered lens or uh, another reason for that. So to summarize, I think uh, 
trifocal iOS and similar lenses have come a long way and I think I use a fair number. I've got good numbers with these eyes, 80 Lisa trifocal and the Toric have been very happy. Patients have been very satisfied. So uh, accurate biometry is of course the mainstay besides all the other things that I spoke about and other diagnostic devices also help in improving your overall management and results. Attention to details and talking to the patient and understanding the patient needs is very, very important for a satisfactory outcome. And I think outcomes analysis is also very important to keep improving yourself. And with that, I'll stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gaurav. And uh, I think uh, uh, straight away from where you left, you talked right in towards the end about uh, laser vision correction in patients and IUL power calculation. Uh, we're going on to, we'll have the discussion after that. Uh, we are going on to Dr. Shri Ganesh, uh, who, uh, as we all know, is uh, the, the uh, chairman of uh, Netadama Group of Eye Hospitals and is a great, great uh, cataract and a refractive surgeon and uh, a great voice in uh, uh, the procedure of uh, cataract and refractive surgery. Uh, won several awards and uh, he's going to talk about uh, the trifocal that he is is using even in post uh, laser vision correction cases over to you shri uh, good evening uh, friends uh, thank you dr maipal and dr namrata for inviting me to this uh, webinar and uh, let me start uh... okay is my screen uh, are you seeing my screen yes just make it slide show Okay. Um, okay. So I'll be talking about my experience of implanting uh, uh, a trifocal lens in a post mile uh, <clears throat> patient, and this is the first report of its kind. And we published this. I'm a consultant to Kalza is Meditech. Uh, usually, we avoid using a multifocal or <clears throat> a trifocal uh, post refractive surgery because the uh, accuracy of uh, outcomes uh, is not uh, guaranteed. Uh, there, it's because of various uh, reasons. Uh, there's excessive flattening after myopic uh, laser vision correction of the cornea, and then the normal curvature is lost. So uh, the central uh, case, uh, normally which you measure is in the three millimeter zone, but the central area is flattened much more, and this the, there's a discrepancy. Also the gulf strands ratio, which is the ratio of the anterior curvature and posterior curvature is changed. and uh, this also alters the refractive outcomes, plus the ELP also, which is uh, calculated as per the nomograms, depending upon the K values and the axial length uh, is off. And uh, this also gives a refractive surprise. So uh, with a uh, multifocal or a trifocal, you should be within uh, 0.25 diopters uh, sphere and within half uh, adapter of cylinder for uh, good patient satisfaction. Uh, but uh, with today's uh, diagnostic tools, you can actually pick out patients who are suitable for uh, multifocal or trifocals. And I'll just be going through that as to how you can plan for using a trifocal in uh, post-laser vision correction. Uh, I'll take you to the, through this case. This is the uh, first case report of a post-mild cataract surgery where we implanted a trifocal. This was a 50-year-old, 50 54-year-old male who underwent refractive surgery. We did SMILE for him seven years ago in 2013. And his pre-refractive surgery refraction was minus 9.5 sphere, 0.5 cylinder, minus 10 sphere, uh, 0.5 cylinder. And uh, post-refractive surgery, he had an excellent result and he had 6x vision in both eyes, uncorrected, and he was very happy with his procedure and getting rid, rid of his thick glasses. Uh, but again, he came back uh, with... Uh, uh, two years ago with complaints of uh, diminution uh, in the vision and poor night vision. And on examination, he had uh, grade 2 nucleus sclerosis in the right eye and left eye grade 1 nucleus sclerosis. His uncorrected vision in the right eye was 6 by 24, and he had uh, index myopia of minus 2.75, improving to 6.9. And in the left eye, uncorrected vision was 6.12, uh, improving with minus 2 sphere and 0.75 cylinder to 6 by 7.5. Uh, so he basically uh, was very happy after laser vision correction. And then after cataract surgery, he wanted spectacle-free vision. And this is what he was expecting. Uh, he said, uh, you helped me the first time to get rid of my glasses. Now after cataract surgery, I don't want to wear glasses. So he was quite demanding. So how, uh, the first thing very important is that you need to do a tomography or a topography uh, to look at the centration of the ablation. This is his... Uh, 
uh, pentacam and you can see that uh, the ablation is quite large and well centered in both eyes so this is very important because if you have a very small ablation and a decentered ablation this these patients typically don't do very well they have a lot of night vision problems loss of contrast abrasions and then uh, if you put in a multifocal or a trifocal uh, then they are quite unhappy so you have to do the topography look at the uh, zone of flattening and the centration and in this case you can see the zone of uh, flattening and the centration was quite good i also like to look at the holiday ekr uh, report and this is very important you will have to look at the distribution of the ekr uh, this is very important if it's like a, a gaussian distribution with a central peak then uh, these cases have a uniform kind of distribution of the k and uh, these patients do uh, better with uh, um, post operatively either with monofocal or with uh, toric uh, trifocal lenses Uh, if the distribution is uh, not uniform and you don't have the central peak then typically these patients uh, you can have errors in biometry and then uh, the results are going to be off so avoid patients uh, who don't have a good distribution of ekr um, uh, especially putting in a in a trifocal lens then i also look at the uh, zernike analysis on the pentacam and look at the abrasions in this patient uh, you can see he had quite a bit of flattening because he had almost about 10 diopters of uh, myopia and uh, you can see the z4 is what you'll have to look at and the z4 in the right eye was uh, 0.677 posterior spherical abrasion because of the flattening and in the left eye it was 0.532 it is acceptable i mean if it is uh, 0.6 and within 0.6 then uh, the spherical abrasion is not very high and if you use a negative aspheric uh, lens it can compensate and come within the accepted uh, limits so accepted accepted limits is uh, within 0.6 so with the size uh, trifocal it's around uh, 0.2 um, a negative spherical abrasion so you would expect the z4 post op to be around uh, 0.4 uh, or 0.3 in the left eye which is well within the normal range Uh, so this is something that you have to look at and if if the higher order abrasions are uh, um, very high and especially the z4 is very high uh, then uh, it's probably better to uh, avoid putting a multifocal or a trifocal then uh, regarding the calculation itself uh, you will have to be uh, use the latest generation formulas and it is better to check with different formula for example Uh, this is the barrett's universal 2 with the barrett's universal 2 you can see that uh, the size trifocal uh, the lens for emetropia on the right eye was 18.5 left eye 18 diopters uh, and this was the um, barrett universal 2 tk using true uh, uh, i mean total keratometry because this is uh, again uh, a new formula which is there in the iol master 700 and uh, normally the barrett's uh, universal 2 um, kind of uh, compensates for the posterior cornea using a nomogram uh, it compensates for the gull strands ratio uh, by most of the formulas do that by adjusting the um, keratometric index uh, refractive index but here with the tk you are actually measuring both the anterior and posterior surface and not assuming it uh, in most of the formulas it assumes it to be kind of normal um, but here you are actually measuring it so it's more accurate and you have to use the barrett universal 2 tk along with the uh, total keratometry so it gives both the anterior and posterior uh, curvatures and with that it showed uh, uh, a lens of 19 that would be the previously with just the universal 2 it was uh, showing 18.5 with this uh, 19 diopter lens for the right eye and 18 diopter lens for the left eye oops sorry then we also looked at the uh, true k formula now the true k is meant for prior uh, uh, laser vision correction and then it has uh, a nomogram adjustment uh, which kind of corrects for the change in the gull strands ratio um and also uh, the effective lens uh, position and uh, with the true k it actually uh, gave us 19.5 after uh, 
lens for emetropia and 19 diopters in the left left eye, which was different from the TK. And then we, as uh, Gaurav explained, we also went uh, to the ACRS online calculator uh, and you put in all the details and then it gives you various formulae. So if you look at the various formulae, uh, the mask at 19.91, almost 20 diopters, modified mask, mask at about 20 and a half diopters, Barrett Truque, 19 and a half diopters, Shamas, 20.66. So you can see that all of them are different. So it's quite confusing, which one do you select? Uh, because these are based on basically nomograms uh, and um, which takes in various factors. So each one is different. And if you look at the left eye also, you can see that uh, the various uh, formulae give different values uh, even for the left eye. So it's... Uh, we decided to go in for uh, what we do is we consider normally these formulae uh, when looking at uh, correction because these are the formulas post refractive uh, surgery which we find give the most accurate results. One is the EKR with the holiday two uh, formula and uh, that gave us 18.5 in the right eye and 18 in the left eye. Then the um, IOL Master TK with uh, Barrett Universal 2 TK. It gives, gave us 19 diopters in the right eye and 18 diopters in the left eye. Masket was uh, nearly 20 diopters and 20.5. The Hagis L also is good for post refractive surgery. That gave us 19.5 and 18, almost 19 diopters. And the True K, the True K also is quite good. Uh, and this is, uh, I think, the formula that most people would use. Uh, that gave us 19.5 and 19. Now, there is a new formula which uh, Barrett has uh, made, which is the Barrett True KTK. It's called the True KTK. So it's a fine tuning of the uh, TK formula, but uh, for post refractive surgery. And uh, that is available only online. It is still not incorporated in the IL Master 700, but you can go online and calculate with, calculate with it. And it's supposed to give uh, more accurate results. In fact, he presented his data of 60 eyes in the last ASCRS and he showed that it was much more accurate than the true K or just the TK. So now we also use that to calculate. So we decided to go in with the IL Master TK because there was quite a bit of flattening and quite a bit of uh, change in Gulstrand ratio. It was almost about 10 diopters. Uh, correction on the cornea. So we went with uh, 19 diopters in the right eye and uh, 18 diopters in the left eye and we implanted a, a 80 LISA, uh, the Zeiss trifocal. So writing uh, 19 diopters in the right eye and 18 diopters in the left eye. And uh, this was the post cataract surgery. Uh, uncorrected uh, distance visual acuity was uh, six, six parts and uniocular in the right eye was uh, six, nine, uh, plus and left eye was 6.9. Binocular uncorrected uh, near visual acuity was N6 and the uniocular in the right eye was N8 plus and left eye was N6. This was the post-op refraction. If you look at the refraction, right eye was uh, planosphere with um, about half a cylinder, half a diopter of cylinder at uh, 130 degrees, getting corrected to 6.6 parts and N6. And the left eye was uh, half diopter sphere, half diopter Cylinder. In effect, this is also Plano with uh, half adapter of uh, uh, cylinder plus at 160. So he was emetropic with uh, just half adapter of sill, uh, which is acceptable. The spherical equivalent, just about 0.25 adapters. And this was an excellent uh, outcome and uh, patient uh, extremely happy and stable at, even at uh, two years. And uh, we also since this was the first case of a post mile being implanted with the trifocal, we published this in the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology and you can also read the detailed case report uh, here. Uh, so to conclude, uh, of course, ZEISS has uh, many solutions uh, for uh, correction of complete range of refractive needs. You can correct refractive error with uh, SMILE or even femtolasic. Presbyopia also can be corrected with Presbyon. And they have the IOL Master 700 now. now the latest is um, it, it has got uh, uh, the corneal topography. So you, you can also get the corneal topography with the IL Master 700 and it has got the 
EQ workplace, uh, which is very effective for the workflow and also to refine post-op for Nomogram. So you can put in all your post-op data into the EQ workplace and then it'll automatically keep correcting it uh, and refining your nomogram. And um, so the, your biometry and outcomes are very accurate. And also it's got excellent IOLs like the uh, Lisa tree and uh, Lara for uh, presbyopia correction so that patients can lead a spectacle free life. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Cool. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shri Ganesh. I think that was a very interesting case presentation. And uh, there are a few questions which are there now, and I would request all the panelists to please check up these questions. One is how many, how many of you would, uh, you know, be okay to do a clear lens extraction and do a trifocal lens for a person who doesn't have a cataract but is in the press biopic age group? Uh, generally, I would. Okay, Dr. Go ahead, Dana. I, yeah, I, uh, I do it. <laughs> okay. yeah, I would uh, probably first do a, a DLI. We, we, we do the eye trace uh, and look at the um, dysmorphic lens index. And then uh, if, if that is uh, actually on the lower side, then uh, it shows that the scatter is more and lens opacities are more. And we also do a HD analyzer. And then uh, we would probably go and uh, opt for uh, putting a trifocal lens. But uh, if it's very clear and the DLI is normal, uh, then I would do uh, more going for a press beyond surgery uh, if there is no cataract. Uh, the only exception is uh, if uh, in hyperopes with uh, very shallow AC and narrow angles uh, who are at risk for angle closure, then uh, basically I would prefer to do a clear lens extraction with the trifocal because it kills two birds at one stone. You do the correction also and then you prevent any angle closure. Yeah, I think uh, two tests of a surgeon or uh, even the intraocular lens or as uh, the diagnostics is to satisfy a clear lens extraction patient. Because when a cataract patient comes with a deficient vision, they accept uh, small inadequacies. This, uh, the expectations of clear lens extraction patients are extremely high. We did mention that you could do away, uh, do uh, trifocals without certain instrumentation. But if you are addressing a patient like this, you have to put these patients through the entire battery of tests to make sure that you know there's nothing wrong with the cornea, the tear film, the kind of uh, toricity has to be dealt with. And uh, today, I was not doing it when we had only diffractive bifocals. Now that I'm comfortable with trifocals, trifocal torics, any patient above the age of 50 or so, who otherwise has an absolutely good OCT, everything is normal, and is a hypero, and he's keen on getting rid of his glasses. We don't have any hesitation in offering this, provided they get it done bilaterally in about a week or two weeks apart. And I find that it does satisfy them quite a bit. If you do a refractive surgery in these patients, ultimately they are going to end up for cataract surgery someday or the other. And whatever will be the excellence of uh, refractive, which we all do, uh, it's already a compromised cornea. So when you have this uh, good IOLs available to us, normal patient, I think a presbyopic patient above 50 years is a good way to go. Dr. Kachin, well, if provided uh, everything is normal, the OCT is good, and the cornea is good because the cornea is what makes life a misery in case you uh, put in a multifocal IOL and the cornea is not up to the mark. And provided the Tracy gives a good result, we proceed with all these patients. Nowadays, uh, a person crosses the age of 40 or 44, we start offering them uh, what I call as Presby uh, facilities right from that point onwards. And if you're sure of your results, that's fine. Only one thing I'd like to add along to what, uh, uh, what was spoken a little earlier is we normally have the two optometrists, both of them have to do all the, all the, all the, all the tests. And they have to present all the data to me. And they provided everything matches, then we proceed. Because sometimes you can get some very odd results. And the one thing problem is that with these patients, if they are, if you don't give them a perfect result, they are extremely unhappy. And if you have to do a LASIK on top of it, and the quality of vision you get is poor. One question to Sri uh, Ganesh, Dr. Mangata. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yes, Sri Ganesh. Uh, Dr. Ganesh, you are around? 
monofocal lens with a neutral uh, asphericity or a positive spherical aberration like uh, something like the sensor or um, the uh, asphericus uh, um, size asphericus which uh, and i like to uh, also aim for a micro mono vision uh, of uh, minus 1.75 adapters they are already used to this kind of uh, vision and they these patients i have done a couple of patients and they are very happy uh, so there is no need to go in for a trifocal you can just put in a monofocal and uh, aim for a micro mono vision they they still maintain the depth of field and uh, they are quite happy with the vision another question before we move on to the next talk is for everybody again in a one eyed patient would you put a uh, you know trifocal lens one eyed patient with cataract i generally don't prefer to put a trifocal in a one eyed patient because uh you need summation uh, there is some amount of loss of contrast and when you implant it in both eyes there is uh, it's got an additive effect and summation and then this improves the contrast um in a one eyed patient again uh, uh, because they need to have good contrast and later on if they develop any other problems like age related macular degeneration the putting a multifocal would actually make it worse so i would avoid putting a multifocal in a one eyed patient okay i think uh, dr kudlu yes anybody wants to say anything before i, I have uh, placed uh, uh, trifocals in uh, one eyed patients i mean either because the other eye is affected because of uh, uh, lost the other eye earlier or injury or something obviously we would look for uh, everything being totally normal uh, as we already emphasized most importantly the macula should be there should not be any dry rmd which could progress and if there is no dioptic retinopathy changes i find that uh, uh, these patients do well and in spite of the fact that we often tell patients that uh, you have to get both eyes operated the quite a few patients who get one eye operated and uh, they are quite happy with it with the other eye having some small power and come for the second eye surgery even a couple of years later so though bilateral summation is always has a uh, positive impact is additive i think uh, many patients are quite happy even with a one eye operated uh, rightly i fully endorse what dr ramamurthy says uh, especially some of the patients who had one eye put a mono they have come to us we have told them we can't do a try for you because you done a mono and one eye they still insist for it and they we had to explain to them that okay at a later stage we'll put in a a, a, a renner uh, converter lens which will convert it to a multifocal more but uh, a lot of them don't don't come back afterwards to do it and they are quite comfortable and you, i asked them i said how are you managing with one eye he said we are very happy but i mean uh, you know the uh, i fully agree with what you say you need summation as mm -hmm. a matter of fact uh, one of the big advantages of doing bilateral cataract surgery especially on these presby patients is that you get instant results and they have nothing to compare it against otherwise they compare one eye against the other and they keep sitting and moaning about it so i think uh, I may, if i may add uh, dr yes, yes. yeah i also uh, you know i'm not very emphatic that patients uh, do get in uh, if they have a i have had two patients who got a trifocal in one eye they had a monofocal in the other and they on their uh, persistent questioning and asking i implanted them and i hold the same view as dr keki does those patients were very happy and they never turned back so uh, so that way also you know i feel that even if you have a monofocal and if the patient is insisting there is no really no harm in going at subject to the condition that everything else is perfectly fine 
Okay, I think with this we come to the next talk, or, uh, which is going to be given by Dr. Krishna Prasad Kudlu, and he's going to be talking about AT Lisa Tri 839 MP Trifocal My Personal Experience. I'll be sharing the screen. Can you hear me, Dr. Nandita? There's a lot of echo, uh, Dr. Krishna Prasad. I hope there's only one instrument which is logged in and not not two of them. The instrument. Because there's a lot of eco which is coming. Is it fine? Oh, it's still fine. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Dr. Nambulta? Yeah. I'm talking about my experience of uh, trifocal 839 MP. Uh, this is my financial disclosure and consulted for Carl Zeiss India. Just I think uh, most of our senior speakers and my friends spoke about why we have to move with the uh, multifocal lens, why we have to do the perspiratic uh, solution because the natural crystalline lens has got good accommodation which has got in clear vision in all the distance and the more rotational asymmetry with the minimal ablation. So these are the few options for perspiratic. I've been doing a lot of presbyon but uh, you a lot of trifocal, but my mainstay of my talk is to the trifocal in talk and then. I think coming to the one or two point already, Sarkar already said about the technology behind this IL, but diffractive IELs, what happens the principle of here, the diffraction in connection with the interference to create more than one focal. Basically, what happens, the refractive power is provided from the anterior surface, and the diffractive power comes from the multiple views on the process surface. So, what happens normally, the plane waves, when it hits the endocrine lens, especially multifocal lens, it becomes sort of a spherical waves. When multiple plane waves comes to this IL, it becomes a uh, multiple spherical waves and becomes a more focal points. So, the higher the waking density, the stronger is the angle deviation of light. The more rings are placed on the lens surface, the higher is the add power. So, here is the picture showing that shorter the width, higher the add power, wider the width, lower the add power. Suppose if you see here, if any intraocular with multifocal lens, if they say that plus 4 add on the lens, that means it's 3.2x spectacle plane, plus 3 add means it's around 2.25x spectacle plane. These are the few limitations, of course, we need to understand the, with the multifocal lens, especially the previous uh, refractive ions are pupil dependent, decreased contrast sensitivity. We have to tell the patient they have to sometimes wear the glasses, and definitely there is some amount of glare and halos. Of course, very important, everybody knows that nowadays with the intermediate vision. Most of our profession is nowadays, it is connected with the intermediate vision. It's very important to patient to have a intermediate vision. So, everybody wants to have a, lead an active life without being troubled by the eyeglasses. Probably during the time, I think we are thinking about trifocal and proper lens. So, see, now when in bifocal, what happens actually, there is a, you can see here, that there are two types of ways just like uh, there is a large wedge where there is a lower power rate, where there is a small wedge, there is a higher power rate. There is normally seen in the typical bifocal end. But what happens in trifocal lens? There is a one larger wedge and a very smaller wedge which gives both for intermediate and near region. These are good by 839 MB. I think more the previous speaker already told about this. I am not going to talk about this. The greatest advantage with this lens, it has got plus 3.3 for near and plus 1.66 for the intermediate region. And because of the Design of this lens, there is a reduced potential visual disturbance and improved even night vision. So coming to the this lens already, the survey so already told about the light transparent. Almost 85.7 percent light transparent, which is probably the highest in any of the competitive lens. And because of the smooth microface optic design, there is an ideal optical image quality even with the reduced light scattering. This was about already we had told how much like 50 percent for distance, then the remaining for intermediate, 20 for the intermediate, and 30 percent for the near region. So because of this kind of light distribution, the patient normally will have a very good vision. Of course, even it is the overall. 
the lens design is so good you need to optimize for night driving even in reading in the uh, low lighting condition the biggest property of this lens is once again the pco protection which is on the poster surface of the lens even it will reduce the, the poster capsule opacification so coming to lighting this is already shown in the video but this is just a comparison with the other two lenses that is with the apotized bifocal eye from the other company and with the trifocal this is taken from the company with the help of us air force design you can see even in a normal light condition with the 3 mm pupil size and 4.5 mm pupil size you can see the clarity of vision coming to even in the poor light condition also when you compare with the other two lenses these lenses especially with the 3 3 mm pupil size and 4.5 mm pupil size the clarity of vision is much better and even in the high resolution for all the distance so the main i want to give this lenses patient we be able to now clearly focus back and forth at the objects at different distance without the need of to put on correct glasses these are with the loading in the injection system already they are showed in the introduction video just i want to tell you this injection system probably my most favorite injection system if you well works with this then the ultimate this one first inject a some amount of sclera stick to the tip of the cartridge then take the lens already the direction will be given by the in the each lens book they are given the direction put it in the same direction then we will get a click noise then remove that chap then you can see under the microscope whether lens is placed properly or not especially when you are inflating for a very high myopic then you do close the cartridge then put a some amount of whisk elastic So once you put the sun amount of iskala, you can see under the microscope which one. Make sure that lens is going properly within the cathode. Once it is going properly within the cathode, this is the video I am just showing you. I have done fake around three mm pupil size. Even Rexes is out. Behind the pupil still, I am just injecting this. So the material is the trifocal lens. You can see how smoothly it is going within the bag. So absolutely, there is no chance of even you need not have to dial once again. So coming. My experience, I think, there are the 32 eyes of 76 patients. There is a mean age of around 57, and the, the best character visual acuity around 624. Now, last follow up for up to three years, and even means pre-operative pre spherical equivalent minus 0.12 plus or minus 3.06. Normal chart, you can see about uncorrected digital visual acuity and discorrected visual acuity, and it's maintaining through. And the most important about this lens, you can see the spherical equivalent. How much is doing? Of course, we have already spoke about the uh, IO master seven and that. See, this kind of biometry, if you are already having, then of course, if you implant this kind of lens, you will, in the end of three years, you will have. You know, Very minimal spherical equivalent is remaining. So coming to the even one, new deal, uncorrected intermediate visual acuity also after a period of even three years, even almost like around 89 to 87 percent of patient had 6-6 vision and have uh, good the intermediate vision and uh, even 100 percent of patient had a good decent amount of intermediate vision. Even near vision, almost around 92 percent of the patient uh, who doesn't uh, require to wear the glass, uh, glasses. And uh, like N5, and the hundred percent of the patient had arrow N6 pass. This is about the defocus curve already showed. It has got a very smooth defocus curve. That's why the chances of glare and halos are very less. Let me come to the quality of vision as far as the glare is concerned. This is about the experience. If you can see here, sixty percent of the patient had a very uh, good experience with the lenses. Only twenty percent had little bit glare, had a glare, glare with the lenses, but the uh, None of the patient had a severity of glare, and the, even 70% of the patient they never bothered about the this kind of glare. And if you see this chart, I think almost 100% of the patient doesn't need to wear glasses. Only six stage, six percent of the patient really needed a glass for a very small pins. This is about the trifocal toric. I think we have done around 52 patients in 84 eyes, mean age, and the follow-up for two years. This is about the um, all of the parameters and mean preoperative astigmatism is around 1.4 around two diopters cylinder. Once again, here you can see in the graph. I think uh, it has been with the uncorrected visual visual acuity and discorrected visual acuity is maintaining till the two years follow-up. Once again, see here very important what you can see in the spray. How much is 
the spherical equivalent is remaining is around 0.25. Whenever I implant with bowhead with the toric trifocal lenses, always I target for a slightly minor peak in both eyes so that patient will have a very good distance and very good intermediate and very good near vision. Coming to the refractive astigmatism, I think uh, more than 95% of the patient actually had refractive astigmatism less than 0.5 after. Even the initial part of my this thing I used to mark with the in front of the sit lamp, I used to take inside the OT and I used to do a toric trifocal, but now I am access with the calistro system, I think the results are almost same. So in conclusion, trifocal intraocular lens implantation can perform by any cataract surgeon who is aware of the principles of refractive surgery and handles precise intraocular lens calculation. The trial demonstrated an excellent functional vision at distance, intermediate, and near in all our clinical evaluation. Almost all patients enjoyed spectacle independence after 80 years of trial implantation in this clinical evaluation. Once again, I thank Dr. Michael, sir, Member of the Madam, and Kalga is India for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you, Member. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kudlu, uh, for the presentation. And I think we would now go on to the next talk, uh, which is Dr. Narayan Shetty, and he's going to be talking about on clinical workflow for success with trifocal intraocular lenses. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. On the on this onset, I would like to thank uh, Mahipal sir, uh, Namrata ma'am, and Zais for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I was given the topic to talk about a successful workflow for a trifocal IOL practice. Now, to achieve this, uh, first and foremost is choosing the right patient, which is very, very crucial. For this, we need certain uh, sets of equipments. So let's go one by one over it. Uh, if you do a, a good slit lamp uh, examination, you have just one half the battle. So make sure you do not miss any kind of abnormalities. Look at the tear film also, make sure the tear bird and shimmers are normal. Uh, in terms of pupil, uh, this is something that we always miss out. Uh, look at the pupil size, uh, make sure the pupil size is more than three millimeters and uh, less than five millimeters for topic and scotopic pupil. And uh, angle alpha also is uh, one of uh, important factor, but even though it's very rare that it goes into the abnormal range, but still it's good to have a look at it. Uh, basically it is nothing but the visual uh, distance between the visual axis and the limbal center. And this value should be less than 0 0.6. Now biomet biometry, like uh, everyone was uh, mentioning earlier, optical is the gold standard. Please try to stick to it because the results are extremely, extremely good and accurate. Uh, but if you do, if you don't have it, uh, but still it is still okay, but stick to immersion. Do not try uh, a contact method. Uh, then we need to look at uh, how the surface of the cornea is. Now these are the machines. And uh, if at all you do have such uh, bad uh, corneas, I think it's better to avoid. Uh, uh, I mean, avoid directly doing the surgery. Uh, so keep a target as if the best uh, is if the values of higher vibration is less than 0 0.3 is the best candidate. Uh, the maximum you can push it uh, max to 0 0.5 or so. Now, uh, by just looking at the surface, uh, you shouldn't just simply go ahead. Always try to look a little more deeper. Sometimes the irregularity might be just from the epi epithelium itself, which can be uh, treatable, which I'll talk to you in detail later on. Uh, this is one of the most important thing I, I feel uh, doing a macular OCT is very crucial, not just for premium IOLs. I feel in every cataract workup, this has to be a standard protocol uh, because in this era, the patient's expectation is just completely off the roof. And uh, if we miss out any uh, epiretal membrane or uh, unseen macular edema during fundus examination, we really had it uh, post-surgery. Um, in terms of IOL formula, I think it is uh, unanimous and uh, it is uh, easy um, uh, and it works in all situations. I think Barrett Unicel 2 is simple and I think I really feel at this moment we should all follow the same. Uh, the three C's, the counseling, 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 it's so important that you really need to put uh, your uh, uh, your time uh, with the patient, uh, speak to him, uh, talk to him about the pros and cons. Uh, my way of uh, one of the key things which I normally tell is uh, these lenses basically splits the light and focuses three places, that is distance, intermediate, near. And because it splits the light, whenever you look at bulbs, you see these rings. And whenever you see the rings, that means the lens is working really well. If you just tell these 
few words believe me after the surgery whenever he sees this light or rings and halos he'll be like very happy and he'll be like oh wow lens is working so please tell uh, you know certain things and uh, you know explain to the patient what he might expect for surgery now uh, i like i always say i always use uh, ctrs in uh, all my toric patients uh, now why ctr in all the, all my patients is this is a oct image of uh, uh, post surgery immediate post surgery you can see a huge uh, space between the posterior capsule and the lens this is one of the main reasons why there is a high a higher chance of uh, lens rotation uh, in the early post operative period so when whenever we implant a ctr basically it expands the back and uh, it brings the anterior ca anterior posterior capsule closer together and uh, improves the contact between the lens and the back now uh, this is an image where a ctr is placed and you can see a beautiful contact between the posterior capsule and the lens Uh, one uh, one more suggestion is i would really uh, suggest uh, everyone to try to polish the anterior capsule uh, this would really uh, improve the visual or optical quality of the eyes uh, post implantation of all these trifocal eye rings so let's go over a, a few cases so here's a case uh, a month uh, a month old uh, a patient who's operated with trifocal eye uh, had the uh, 66 vision and n6 for distance and near uh, but extremely annoyed with his vision So when we look closer, uh, there was more abrasion arising from the cornea. So we looked closely at the tear film and we realized that was the culprit. So we did uh, uh, we put the patient on dry eye treatment and the patient improved and immediately even with the scans and when we looked at the optical quality, uh, it improved. Now coming over to the next case, again the patient post surgery had severe glare and uh, even the optical quality uh, assessment uh, said the same. So. when we looked uh, closely at the slit lamp uh, there was actually decentration or nasal decentration of the lens so you always remember these multifocal or trifocal lenses uh, are uh, very sensitive to decentration so always look for it and uh, make sure that the lens is centered post surgery uh here's a case three patient who is unhappy and uh, this is because of a posterior capsular opacification Uh, which is easily treatable but uh, uh, keep in mind that uh, the early or even uh, the little amount of pco can significant uh, can have a significant effect in visual quality in these patients so don't shy away from uh, doing these lasers even those even though these lenses have a good uh, you know pco barrier uh, pco barriers but still there is a chance of happening so uh, don't don't shy away on doing the laser now uh, here's uh, uh, one more the fourth case is uh, here post surgery the patient was left with cylinder so we wondered how did that happen how did we miss this out so when we look closer actually the surgeon had ordered a toric uh, trifocal lens and the company by mistake sent a regular trifocal lens and the doctor did not check this is a very important thing that you need to have multiple checkpoints to make sure the lens that you place doesn't matter even a trifocal even a monofocal should be uh, checked at multiple points that it is the right lens and then only impact Now, uh, coming to the fifth case, here's a 45-year-old uh, uh, male patient who had dimness of vision in both his eyes since six months, and uh, when we look closer, he did have cataract in both eyes and is very keen on going for a multifocal or trifocal lens. Now, uh, when we see these scans, the right eye seems fine. There's a little bit of irregularities in the left eye, but the thing is, we shouldn't label any of these patients before looking at the epithelium. So, when you look at the epithelium, there is actually the irregularity is occur occurring more from the epithelium than the stroma. Stroma looks perfectly good and nice. So, what we did is we put the patient on uh, uh, treatment uh, for a month, uh, and uh, one month when we uh, asked the patient to come, uh, the, uh, the epithelium healed beautifully, and then we went ahead with the trifocal implantation. Now, what do we do uh, when uh, post LASIK patients come to us and ask for a trifocal eye oil implantation? So, how do we go about these cases? So, there are two ways. One is if uh, obviously uh, all the previous criteria has to fit in. There is no two ways about it. But uh, generally talking, if the cornea is regular, well centered ablation, then you can simply go ahead with the trifocal eye oil implantation. But if the cornea is irregular, you have two ways of doing this. the first uh, you can plan uh, you can do a, a topoidal treatment uh, and then uh, after 2 months you can reassess and then go for the trifocal eye oil uh, the option 2 is uh, some few doctors do a uh, trifocal eye oil first and then go for a tcat or a wafer guided treatment but uh, uh, we personally uh, believe in doing a tcat first so that at 2 months post tcat we can reassess the patient again or reassess the eye and decide again whether his eye is suitable for the trifocal or not
So that way we are always safe. So the take home message is choosing the right patient is very important. Uh, counseling is very crucial. If you do good counseling, uh, believe me, uh, you will, you uh, you have like 90% of the cases is you can rest assured just, the, just because of counseling, the patient will be happy. Uh, if you put an unhappy patient into an equation, unhappiness is equal to expectation divided by reality. So basically make sure the patient's expectation is as realistic as possible. That way the patient is always happy. Try to avoid very high demanding patients. Always have a closer look for any abnormalities. A good practice does not just mean having a lot of patients. You need to have patients too. And lastly, uh, always keep your uh, patients, happy patients close and unhappy patients closer. So whenever a patient is unhappy, make sure you, uh, you know, talk to him more, keep in touch with him and make sure he realizes that, that you are with him till the time he's very happy. Thank you for your time. So thank you, Nalin. I think uh, those were really practical tips on how to uh, counsel these patients and what should be your workflow. And, uh, I think uh, very useful tips. Anybody wants to make any comments on any aspect before we move on to the next talk? So I think uh, we'll now go on to the next talk, uh, which is going to be given by Dr. Rohit Om Prakash. And he's going to be talking about tips for success with Zaya's toric trifocal IOLs in the astigmatism management. Thank you, Dr. Namrata and uh, Zais for calling me over. Well, I would be taking up one important aspect, and that is the tips for success with Zais, Toric, and Trifocal IOLs in astigmatism management. Well, progress stops upon satisfaction, so never be satisfied. So it's always a journey, and we have to go on raising our bar. Well, the goal in premium IUL surgery is to have refractive error within plus to minus 0 0.50 diopters. Well, in a study done to, find, to evaluate the dissatisfaction in trifocal IULs, they found that in these patients, the refractive astigmatism of greater than 0 0.50 diopters was there in 63% of cases. Myopia, it was 45 and hyperopia, 20%. And with better patient selection, the increased higher and the better quality of intraocular lenses, there's an increased ocular high order abrasions had gone down to 13%. So if we have to talk about, you know, these uh, trifocal torics, so the, there are two components wherein we have to target the refractive spherical correction. And once we achieve then, then only we have to move to the second part, that is the astigmatic correction to 0 0.50 diopters. The accuracy of intraocular lens calculation formula, it was a study of around 13,301 cataract surgery, uh, surgeries. And it was found that the Barrett Universal 2 formula scored over all other intraocular lenses for that matter. And this you will find that's the stacked histogram comparing the percentage of cases within a given diopter range. And we found that it was found that the Barrett's one outscored everyone because within plus zero, from zero to 0 0.25%, it was there in 50 and 0.25 to 0 0.50, it was there in 80, which scored better than most of the formulas in hand. And when comparing the axial length, as far as the different formulas was concerned, you will find that this Barrett out here outscored all other uh, formulas which were available in the study. Axial length, I've already talked about. You will find this is the red one, which is with the Barrett. So that outscored everybody. Then coming to the keratometry average, here also the Barrett's outscored uh, all other formulas. Then interior chamber depth, you will find Barrett's is there which is as close to the zero as possible. IUL power calculations, you will find with this, the Barrett's also was very much there in the within the normal ranges. So spherical power, uh, you know, as far as uh, prediction was concerned, the non-toric -toric ones, the Barrett Universal 2 scored all the way. So when it, so that was one part. The second part was 
that the prediction prediction accuracy independent of toric cylinder so as and how it shifted from t3 to t4 to t6 the barrett's wa was very much within the normal ranges so that assured you know we reached a situation wherein we concluded that uh, you know the toric universal 2 scored when it came to the spherical correction next came the astigmatic correction which had to be reduced to 0.50 diopters so k reading calculation is a very important and integral part of it we have to evaluate the quality of the corneal myers if the myers are not crisp and clean the validity of all other corneal measurements are diminished so you have to treat or stabilize as has already been put forth in the previous talks uh, any ocular surface disease dry eye use there has to be a liberal use of lubricants for proper k readings keratometry non touch virgin as we are, as had already been told uh, keratometry prior to corneal contact should be done aplanation tonometry contact biometry avoid using of uh, anesthetic drops or fluorescent staining so this is what happens you will find in the iol master it is there and if you find these are just spread out you can use these uh, uh, what do you call the lubricating drops and the come down and the a uh, cylindrical astigmatic part reaches to normal levels so distribution of corneal astigmatism is there in 53% of patients it's more than 0.75% uh, seven in uh, is there in patients who have corneal astigmatism of more than 0.75 diopters and patients who have more than uh, more than one diopters that is prevalent in say around 38% of patients so this part definitely needs to be looked into because the first and the foremost thing which was the cause of uh, dissatisfaction in the patients was the uh, corneal astigmat uh, was the astigmatic correction which cropped up after surgery so astigmatism can be with the rule astigmatism or it can be against the rule astigmatism so but you know the most important thing is which we have to realize is that we have to take care of the posterior cornea also with the rule astigmatism decreases as and how they say and it is usually seen that it doesn't uh, decrease remarkably till the age of 50 but after the age of 50 with every decade it comes down to 0.25 to 0.3 to 0.5 uh, diopters and it shifts towards the against the rule so posterior corneal as far as that is concerned that doesn't have much bearing whatsoever that doesn't change much so against the rule k value underestimates total astigmatism with the rule k value overestimates total astigmatism so posterior corneal astigmatism which is the cause cannot be overlooked in these patients so we have to use formulas which incorporate the posterior corneal astigmatism another aspect which has to be seen is the toricity ratio now what is this toricity ratio it is the astigmatic correction at the lens plane uh, it's the ratio with the astigmatic correction at the corneal plane most calculators take toxicity uh, toricity is not the toxicity the toricity ratio at 1.5 this however varies and you can have a surprise and you have to check with the lens manufacturer that what are they are taking into consideration so the ratio is progressively higher for intraocular lenses that are less than 22 diopters and progressively lower for intraocular lenses that are greater than 22 diopter this error error has been pointed out by several investigators with the forward toric il calculation toricity ratio also depends on the corneal par the k reading also another important factor is the iol thickness and principal plane so physical parameters like iol thickness will affect toric calculations so these things have to be taken into consideration because the par and trocular lens thickness will impact corneal cylinders too by impacting on effective lens position some manufacturers manipulate the ge geometry so that the principal plane does not change thereby not affecting the effective lens position and toricity ratio to some extent so principal plane for those who might not be aware of that is the hypothetical plane in the lens system at which all the refractions can be considered to happen so but all said and done the role of posterior corneal astigmatism decreases with the increase in astigmatic error uh, also so choosing the right formula is also very important so baric toric calculator is the formula which is the preferred one as has been shown in different studies 
So swept source OCT based IOL master, I'm using the, if you have that handy with you, you can use the TK. Try not to use Shamflug readings as constants are going to change. So you have to manipulate the constants also when you have to take these Shamflug readings also. So Barrett Toric calculator is better, it's better than Barrett Toric calculator with uh, total K. So this is something which has to be seen. So you can rely on Barrett Toric calculator, the maximum when it comes to Toric calculation in virgin corneas, which have not had laser vision correction. So moreover, this Barrett Toric, I don't have any financial interest with the Barrett uh, Toric calculator, but all you know formulas, they have are population driven. Whereas the Barrett territory calculator, cal PCA calculations are primarily based on ocular parameters and to a smaller extent by database. So that makes Toric uh, Barrett calculator more accurate because of the, because it incorporates better the posterior corneal astigmatic uh, calculations. So this is, you know, the different things wherein you show that it is much better than, uh, you know, all other formulas for that matter. So as you will see, the prediction error here is uh, within uh, in T2, T3, T4, T5, T6, T7 is the maximum predictability is with the Barrett Toric calculator. So age related changes in corneal astigmatism has to be there. So uh, are there astigmatism practically remains stable till 50 years of age. No doubt there are some changes and there's a 0 0.25 diopter shift towards the against the rule astigmatism uh, per 10 years. So in young patients, keep the patient slightly with the rule to compensate uh, ideally in long term for against the rule as to, uh, against the rule shift. So now what to do that part is done when the astigmatism is more than 0.75 diopters with PCA corrected. So if it happens to be less than 0.5, try to make an on axis, you know, 2.8 millimeter in C and no doubt that with the centroid concept of surgically induced astigmatism uh, with point with 2.2 and 2.8 it is not much of a difference there's hardly 0.12 to 0.14 uh, with this thing and you can always go in for uh, opposite clear corneal incision well if the facility for flax is available laser relaxing incisions can also be undertaken so in my practice cutoff is 0 0.7 diopter astigmatism uh, and for both with the rule and against the rule, that goes without the same. And then the most important factor, the next factor is, you know, once that part is done, then we have to see whether we can align it the way we want to. So it has been, we, I use the Zeiss Catech suite, uh, which is the markerless system, wherein, uh, you know, the, where there's a precise alignment starts with excellent biometry from the IOL master family from Zeiss. And we connect it. Uh, it connects uh, the Callisto to the Callisto and ultimately uh, onto the Zeiss Opma, uh, Opme Lumra family. So, so biometry and reference image is there. Then it is automatic data transfer to the operation theater and surgical alignment and visualization is there. So there is, uh, it's, uh, you, you don't have to go in for the manual, uh, you know, pre-op marking, manual data transfer and manual intra-op uh, marking. So this is the IOL Master 700, which I'm using for all practical purposes, no financial interest, just that I'm very happy with it. And, uh, you know, there's a comparative evaluation of toric eye intraocular lens alignment and visual quality with image guided surgery and conventional three-step manual marking. The conclusion was that the image guided uh, surgery allows precise alignment of toric IOL without need for reference marking. It is associated with superior visual quality which correlates with the precision of IL alignment. Concluding, I personally feel if you have, uh, you know, uh, what do you call any astigmatism associated with the uh, with any IUL, no doubt these people say that the the Zeiss people and the Alcon people with the pan optics that it does take care. But my uh, uh, view is that we should uh, take care of the astigmatism appropriately so that we can bring it. Uh, within 0 0.50 diopters. So the conclusion is that appropriate evaluation of corneal astigmatism is obligatory and mandatory, appropriate use of biometry formulas and proper alignment of toric IO, trifocal toric. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Rohit Om Prakash. I think a very comprehensive talk on uh, toric trifocals. And I think uh, the advantage of uh, the ZEISS platform is that in a trifocal platform, you have a toric option. So uh, I think uh, with this, we'll come to the last uh, talk, which is uh, by the doyen of ophthalmology himself, uh, Padm Shri awardee, uh, Dr. Keki Mehta. And he is going to be talking on how to develop successful trifocal IOL practice. And following this, we'll take the questions. Oops. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay. One second. Huh? I don't know where I've gone. Share screen. Share screen, sir. Uh, okay. Yes. Sir. I'm going to talk on how to develop a successful drive focal IOL practice. I started my practice right when the early days when Zeiss was there. They started off and I was probably one of the earliest to start putting trifocal IOL practice. And uh, the question is, irrespective of how great the lens is, if you can't sell that lens to a person, then it really is not going to be of any use. Patients expect a great life. Cataract is evolved, is no longer a medical procedure, it's now a vision correcting qualities. We know trifocals are exceptional. Six speakers before me have all spoken about it. But how do you effectively market a trifocal lens? Let me show you how. How do we counsel a patient? Now, the standard counseling technique, what I call is a non productive way, is you tell the patient about regular monofocal IOLs. You mention the cost and the type of monofocals available. You tell him about trifocals and the cost. And if he chokes about the cost and the price, you mention extended wear. Chances are that 75% of the patients will go for monofocal, if not all of them. Let us go into the basics of marketing for the answer. Because once you understand the concept behind it, you can manage to get 70% of your patients to multifocal, which is where you should be. That's where the money is. The basic concept is, and the basic axiom of advertisement is, that instead of selling a product itself, you have to make the customer want it or need it. In other words, you have to create an emotional response. That is what they say, sell the sizzle, not the steak. The features of the product itself are not as critical as the emotional connection you create with the customer. There's no point telling him, oh, it's a great lens, it's got rings, you will see great. A patient says, I'm perfectly okay with the monofocal, and you lost their patient. So what are the three keys to successful marketing? And this essentially you have to share with your optometrists or the ones who handle it first. The three essential steps to success. Make the patient want the product. The patient will buy on emotion and justify their purpose purchases using facts and sell the benefits, not the features. Let me take you through all three of them one by one. Once you learn this art, the number of patients you get for trifocals will increase very significantly. An emotional concept. You want to buy a car. You have a certain type of vehicle in mind. You reach out to the potential customer and you let him know how a certain car would make him feel. It will make him feel happy. It will be cooler. He will be willing to go... And, uh, you, you know, people will look at you in this car and they will say, I have a great car. And will you be willing to go out? And a lot of them will go outside their range. Let us take a classical sales pitch on what we call as a literal advertisement. They never sold the soap at all. They never talked about the soap. They came alive with freshness. That was the basic little ad, a girl. And that is what essentially sold the soap so tremendously. At no point did they say that the soap cleaned well or the soap smelled well. The soap was not a pride. Yet. They literally based it on emotion. Now, people have to understand, decide on a purchase, they buy on their emotion. 
and they justify their purchases using facts. Think of it. One thing from the customer's point of view, what is in it for him? There's no point talking about a product. The product is not the point. They know, they have come to you. They know you're a great doctor, that you have a great product. The question is, okay, will they want to and will they be willing to pay more for it? So you have to explain to them that one of the most powerful techniques, therefore, of selling is to know the difference between two concepts, benefit and features. Let me explain to you how this works out. I know it may sound a little ludicrous, but when you sit in front of the patient and you sell, these things matter. Features are essentially the facts and figures of a product. Okay, great product, trifocal, etc., etc., etc. Benefit is what the patient will get out of your product. What is he going to get more by your selling this to him? To give an example, when you sell a computer, you may say it's got 25 gigs of RAM and 3 TB hard drive, and unless you're a computer person, that is very boring. But if you should turn around and say that this computer which I'm selling you will work much faster, it boots up, the battery lasts, and, the, and will make the customer's life easier, then he will go in for your product. So the whole answer is that you have to tell the patient the benefits he's going to achieve. And the other third little important question is need and want. Something that they want and can be put aside to later is a want. You may, for example, you may want to have a very costly car, but at present COVID has come. You can put it aside. That is not important. Need is something, for example, you need to have something which will make your life significantly better. Then I must have it. And that is what is a need. So you have to make a person feel the need for trifocals. If the customer wants fully corrective vision, he can do with reading glasses. And if you monetize the difference, patient will automatically go for the monofocal lens. So you turn on and tell the patient, this costs so much. All right, the trifocal costs so much more, you're dead. That means you have no longer are going to sell it. But you have to try and make sure that you have to explain to him that with the trifocal, he will be able to perform so much better. And without it, he is not going to feel happy. He is not going to be able to function. He won't be able to read, for example, a bus ticket or a train ticket. He will not be able to read things on the wall. He has to put his head up at a 45 degree angle to read anything which is put up on a notice board. The secret is to make the customer feel that he actually needs it and provides a reason for the need. Then they go in for that. Stress the benefit, not the procedure. Functional advantages, 24-hour good vision, 180 degree vision, no poking is a functional advantage. A patient will dot his head twice and forget it. Emotional advantage. You can interact with another person without the frame in front. You can sell better. You tell the patient, if he is a salesman, it makes a world of difference. If he is a major person sitting in an office, he wants to be able to deal with a person across the table. Feel great at parties. You feel one with the crowd. So the whole thing is you sell the sizzle, not the lens. Remember, the first contact is the most important. The first contact is the refractionist. This is something Dr. Maipal taught me when he first started off with multifocal uh, lenses and also when he started off with the laser. I have to stress that all my thanks apply to him. She has the refractionist has to stress that the patient is ideal for multifocals and it will be explained later. Don't talk too much. Their job is to say multifocals are good for you. You've got a cataract. Multifocals will suit you. Next point is a doctor. The doctor will tell the patient, you're good for trichocals. Again, he doesn't talk too much. That means I don't yap around the area. I mean, I have a whole line of patients that really can't do that. But that we have a trained counselor who will explain all the queries. And if you still have any questions, you can come back to me. That is all my point of contact. The role of the counselor is the most important link in selling a refractive surgery. In many ways, even more important than you are. The best investment you can make is not a new instrument. It's a good empathic counselor. Counselors have to sell and thus they tap into the basic needs. The greatest selling agent is a warm smile. You make sure your counselor smiles there. It's you know, people, when they have, when they train people to talk on telephones and sell objects, they are taught to smile on the telephone, not because anybody can see that smile, but because it makes a great deal of difference. And the biggest problem is never counsel with a table between you and your patient. You must seem to be on the same side. So the counselor and the patient sit not in front of a table, but not across a table. 
is very important because it makes a world of difference as to how the selling goes on. And you will try it. You try it yourself. Put a table in between them. The selling goes down. And again, now the question comes about when they ask her, why a trifocal. And you have to tell the patient, do you want to be a visual cripple? You are not going to be able to see 50% of your vision is gone. Why do you want that? And though a standard gives reasonable distance, they are a poor compromise. And where a trifocal is not an option, but it's compulsory. You have to explain it with them. For example, people who work in stock markets, and there are a lot of them in Bombay, work on architectural plans, or those who are now working, especially at home. It makes a lot of difference. I explain to them that, for example, in an aeroplane where half the half your objects are on top, if your pilot walks in wearing bifocal lenses, get off the plane because you can't see 60% of the equipment which is lying on top in a similar manner. But a final point which you must never forget, you have to stress on the surgeon, not the machine. Every day I see people advertise pictures of instruments. Why are you selling instruments? Sell yourself. Why is that important? Because there are so many instruments on the machines in the market. There will be so many places selling trifocals down the line. He is selling trifocals, he is selling trifocals. But you are unique. Your machine is not. Today you have it, tomorrow your next door neighbor will have it. You stress on the machine, there's no differentiator. Why should he come to you? Why is my practice still functional after almost, what am I saying, 48 years of practicing? Is because I've always stressed on the myself. They click with the patient. Stress on workmanship. Explain to them. When they say, lens market, lens Explain to them that a canvas is only oil and paints. Why does, a, why does one painting sell more than the other? Because it's the painter, not the, not, the, not the machine. In a similar manner, it's the driver of the car which races, not the car. In a horses, it's the jockey which wins. It, he, this is, has to be explained to the patient that you have, when you look at the cost of a lens, it's not the lens, it's a question of who puts it and how well he puts it. Then I usually turn and tell them about hernias. Hernias is only a jali. A jali costs you nothing. But whether your hernia is going to come back depends on how good your surgeon is. So you have to stress on this relationship, not a one-off on a meeting. Be careful also when you raise expectations because with the amount of information available, patients expect the sun, the moon, and the stars above. Some will not be happy with anything less than 6 by 6 and 5. It's important to discover what they are and moderate the expectations. I tell all the patients, they'll be left with a small number. If they have to read fine print, they will have to use a little reading glass, which I give them. I give them a plus two if they carry again off with them. And we tell them that this is what it's going to be. 85% of the time, you will not use glasses, not 100%. Then you don't get people coming back telling you, hey, I couldn't read this fine print. I couldn't do this. I couldn't do that. Again, as a last slide, differentiate yourself in a competitive market. Always be available to your patients. Your phone must always be accessible. In a business, it is safe to say that you never want to be one of many. You want to be the best of you. Position yourself offering a service exclusive and you will be then sought after by a, a specific niche of customers. As a last slide, I'd just like to stress this once again. Don't wait for opportunity. Create it. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Maipal and and. Yeah, and the Zais for giving me this option or giving me this little talk here. I hope there was anybody left at the end of the entire show who was still there to hear me. Thank you so much. I'm I'm sure sir, there will be people uh, left. So thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Uh, uh, there are a couple of questions that I will want uh, uh, all of uh, the uh, speakers to answer. Whoever wants to. Uh, the question is, what about clear lens extraction with the uh, uh, trifocal lenses? Uh, uh, who wants to take that? Uh, Dr. Ram, KK, would do anybody? I'm fine with that. I do clear lens extraction with, uh, with multifocals, with trifocals, and I'm quite happy with them. I think it is something which you should offer to all patients. You see, now is coming a time when the, pres when the 40 and 45-year-old no longer wishes to have glasses. He has not had glasses. He deals with people across the table and he wants to show that he's young and active. And this is what enables him to do it. And it's something you should offer as a regular routine. I do it. So, 
to would you wish to have any cut off age limit where you would prefer to do a uh, clear lens extraction would you wish to uh, we had shri ganesh who got a press by on done on himself would you prefer a, a ram or anybody could uh, do could do maybe you do a lot of press by on where would you want to do a press by on and where would you want to do a clear lens extraction sir like as you see you know said that actually you know, i'll do the address with the dli dysfunction lens index if it is uh, showing a early cataractic changes then i prefer to go ahead with the trifocal lens if the lens is very clear then i go with the press beyond till the age of 50 52 then more than 52 years normally i prefer them to opt for uh, trifocal lenses Okay, sorry, I could only catch uh, uh, some parts of it. You, your cutoff age is fifty-two. Why this uh, is that? That used to be the retirement. No, we do the fifty-five. But because we are in government service, fifty-two at some time. Why? What is uh, sacrosanct about fifty-two? No, no, sir, like fifty. Uh, you want to say thing? What is the cut off? Uh, uh, would the hyperopia? Would you would a person who is hyperopic, emetropic, or myopic? Would that make a difference on your choice? Yes. Doctor Kurlu has turned fifty, so yes. Yeah, or or maybe you can say he he is playing it safe. He doesn't have to get it done yet. Uh, Gaurav, okay. I I do it for select patients. And uh, can you hear me, sir? Hello. Yeah, okay. Yeah, sure. yeah, okay. Yeah. So I do it for select patients, yeah, and you have to. You can't have one rule for uh, you know across the board kind of a situation. Uh, you know, yes, uh, I have done uh, a few patients for bilateral uh, clear lens trifocal exchange, and and these are those patients where you have to see whether their expectations are right and whether they really you know desire it. And I think uh, over the 50 year age group, if a patient uh, requests it and uh, fits into this. Uh, you know group of patients which i feel that is going to do well after explaining everything i would not hesitate to do it and um, i think um, many of us may be doing it already as well okay there are uh, two questions from uh, dr nitya mehta one is that uh, has anybody uh, any uh, uh, experience on oculentis trifocal iol because according to her there is no glare in such uh, in this lens anybody has Rohit, uh, Narain, and uh, Sartaj, anybody? No, sir. No. Nope. Okay, so even I haven't used it. The next question that she has uh, is, I think uh, it was possibly to Shri Ganesh, but uh, maybe uh, 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 Gaurav, you can answer. Is the AP ratio or Gold Standard ratio same following basic surgery and smile? And can we use the same formula for IOL power calculation? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, actually, LASIK and smile would uh, basically do almost uh, similar changes, and I don't think uh, we have to change the formula when uh, you know doing uh, uh, LASIK or smile. And um, frankly, uh, we are uh, doing uh, you know I think the Barrett's true case is working very well for us. I think we already discussed everything, so it essentially is the same in my mind. Okay, so uh, there's a question regarding the PCO uh, in the Zeiss trifocal. Uh, maybe I can start off the close to 500 lenses that I have done. I have yagged only one patient so far, and this is uh, over the last uh, two years. Uh, I think approximately that's when they introduced it, uh, one and a half to two years that uh, I am talking about. So, anybody, uh, Dr. Keki, what is your experience as regards uh, PCO rates? Uh, Rohit, Narain, uh, all of you. ram okay well frankly speaking the the rate of pco is much lower with zeiss but uh i'm going to put my foot into it once again and i know people are going to comment about it but i normally open up all my capsules at one and a half years once the capsule starts to thicken even slightly the quality of vision drops the ability to read drops and uh, from whatever i could judge opening it up at two years before the capsule becomes uh, opaque is much clearer much easier to handle and i like just doing it as a regular routine i tell my patients when i operate them that at the at after one and a half years you'll be coming we'll be opening up a little open oh, your your thickening is going to occur and we'll open it up it will make you much happier uh sir uh, i think in terms of uh, pco okay. uh, 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 dr ram yeah sure yeah. i i think uh, you know this was my major concern with any hydrophilic intraocular lenses that is uh, pco rates are higher whether it's uh, bosch and lom or zeiss or any company and uh, i remember having a chat with dr zaldivar and like dr keki says he opens up at one and a half years he said i am not bothered about pco i do it at 8 weeks 
so obviously okay. i may not agree with that but then uh, uh, i think uh, i was always a fan of hydrophobic acrylics but then i have heard enough people including maypal himself saying that you know they have been using this uh, zeiss trifocals for a long time and they uh, find the incidence of pco is extremely small company also claims that the though the basic material is hydrophilic the hydrophobic coating and then there's a posterior square edge so maybe these are the factors which help so practically it seems to work well and in case you develop a pco it's a normal eye doing a yag laser is not a great thing so uh what uh, you want to say something uh, yeah. Yeah, i just want to say that uh, you know uh, as a rule i really do not uh, uh, recommend that uh, in myops that we should go in for uh, clearing up the pco uh, the clear posterior capsule because uh, obviously with the long term effects we have to bear in mind number one number two if there is any hint of the patient's satisfaction level going up of his not having the clarity of vision then you know a detailed evaluation of the posterior capsule should be done and in that case it should be done but uh, i am not uh, somehow in favor of uh, routinely doing it i would prefer to do it watch and then do it rather than doing it as a rule no i 100% agree with you rohit i mean i was no way suggesting that we do yag laser as a routine i was just anecdotally telling that this is the the reason i was keeping away from hydrophilic based was the Uh, my concept that i agree with you entirely but then uh, i am hearing from a lot of people regular users of uh, zeiss trifocals that uh, they have very low incidence of pco very low yag rates so obviously there is something to it i agree with my call sir even my rain uh, 300 to 400 uh, uh, trifocals hardly two to three patient had done the yag laser the incidence of pco especially with this uh, trifocals even with their uh, Very focal, much lesser compared to the other models of Zeiss. See, the question is not that. The question is, what do you count at a point at which you have to do YAG? Do you count six six, six nine, six twelve, six eighteen? Where do you have, or do you reach the point where I normally have? I look at a capsule. If I find the capsule is showing signs of thickening, I open it up, because I found that only a person who has a very clear capsule. and has excellent vision is the one who is going to refer cases to you otherwise they go on saying ke usne to kiya tha le nazar nahi aa rahi hai saab ke ki saab i agree with what you are saying but typically whenever a patient comes back to me saying that there is some problem or some even if he complains of slight this thing i dilate do a retro illumination and see that even if there is some ring that is happening or early pco i will do that but Correct. let the patient come back to me with a complaint that is all that i am trying to say and often uh, if you do not look at it carefully and a lot of my fellows and my associates uh, uh, go and get an oct done as to why the patient is complaining etc etc all you have to do is a good dilation and uh, just doing a good uh, uh, coaxial retro illumination that you have on this lit lamp and you will be able to see that so let the incidence is not high that is what i am trying to say i agree uh, people, i agree yeah. entirely but i also i agree with one thing more my regular rule before i do any yag is to first check the oct because it shouldn't be that the oct is the causation for the fall in vision now when i say at one and a half years i yag all patients is all patients who have complaints a patient who doesn't have complaint i don't touch i mean why try to cure something which doesn't require to be curing point so it is only those patients who come to me at one and a half year interval who turn around and do it also i'd like to stress if the patient is a high myop I prefer to polish the capsule. I don't like opening it. Okay, good. Uh, anybody else who wants to say, Sir Taj Narain? Uh, uh, sorry, sir. Actually, just one comment. Uh, we, uh, if I don't know if we realize or don't realize, actually, we take little more extra attention uh, in uh, treating these trifocal eye holes. So the polishing will be more meticulous than a normal uh, monofocal lens. Uh, that having said that you know uh, uh, these lenses because we do uh, take little extra attention you know the pco rates also is extremely low and the design of the lens is good enough uh, to prevent uh, you know uh, after such meticulous polishing to prevent this uh, other this one and uh, e even mine and uh, and we we also follow the same uh, our threshold is patient complaining of vision and then only we touch the eye or uh, do a yag yeah thank you uh anyone else sir taj you want to say something yeah, yeah. 
Actually, just following up on uh, Dr. Narayan's comment on good polishing, and you know, like sometimes you want to do something different for these patients. Um, one thing is that you know, uh, and I'd also like to raise this question to everyone that this ha this lens has a plate haptic, so it's a much larger haptic, uh, and you know, you will tend to combine this lens with uh, femtosecond assisted uh, cataract surgery. Do you prefer to do a larger capsulotomy in patients uh, where you're implanting this lens, or do you just go ahead with the normal size? Because one thing that we like to do is actually, uh, we prefer to go to a larger capsulotomy size with these almost six millimeters. So even that, you know, just sort of closes the bag better and sort of reduces the chances of PCO over time is one thing that we have felt. Uh, I heard I, a comment. Uh, sorry, 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 my part. I just heard a comment that you that, uh, for all toric lenses, for example, they are putting in uh, a capsular tension ring. Does a CTR make a difference in uh, in the frequency of yak? Uh, my one, you'd be knowing better. I don't do that. I have heard it often. People saying that you can reduce the incidence of PCO, etc. I don't use a CTR until, of course, I have a large eye or I'm seeing some capsular laxity or anything like that. Then I would definitely do that. Uh, high myopes, I do uh, prefer at times to put it, but normally cases, I don't uh, really do that. And even uh, taking up from where Sartaj said, I don't decrease the capsule automate to six because you don't get a good uh, uh, lap, overlap over the uh, lens and the incidence of PC goes higher. And in any case, if you are doing a six on a capsulotomy on a catalyst uh, or any any other platform, uh, it will become uh, larger to by about 0 0.2, 0 0.3 millimeters. So that uh, would be uh, taking uh, it outside the lens. So I don't know if others have any thoughts on uh, the same. Yeah, KP. Yeah, KP. Uh, one question to Dr. Gauri Lutra. You've been insisting, especially like uh, about the optical biometry. Someone like a beginner, they don't have optical biometry. Given a chance, they are having a topography and also they are having autoreflectometer. When taking about the keratometry, do we prefer to take from autoreflectometer reading or whether we prefer to take from the topography? Uh, what I understood, Dr. Kudlu, was that you're asking whether you can take it from the auto keratometer. Is that right? So I would strongly suggest not if you're especially if you're planning to do a toric and frankly if you are doing trifocals you are definitely going to try to uh, you know make sure that astigmatism is uh, well looked after if it exists. So, you know, in very much favor of doing that because autokeratometers typically are not great at uh, picking up the steep meridian and uh, they, they can give you good IL power calculation if you're doing a monofocal IL for sure because the average K will be more or less correct but if you're looking for uh, you know correcting astigmatism along with a trifocal IL that said optical biometry as Dr. Ramamurthy said is not essential only thing is that if you're using immersion scan and maybe two or three reliable cheap devices for keratometry, you can still pay attention to it. The idea is not to depend upon just one device for, you know, your keratometry measurements. You can have, you know, confirmatory tests done by, you know, two or three different methods and look for consistency. And then more attention to detail is required if you're using immersion with manual keratometry. It's just that you have to be more cautious about your formulas and everything and your data. And then you can obviously still get great results. But with an optical biometer, it becomes like a no-brainer, more or less. You know, you can still get great results with the good formulas, with the good optical and no transcription and everything. So it becomes much easier to get results. Okay, one question to you, Gaurav, uh, that should we use TK or K with IUL Master 700 Barrett TK formula for Tariq trifocals. Should I repeat that or you understand? <laughs> I, I got it. I, yeah. I think, you know, uh, in fact, uh, you and uh, Dr. Amamurthy, sir, are the bigger users of the 700 with the TK. But uh, what I understand is TK still plays a role mostly in corneas, which have been dealt with before. And for virgin corneas, I think, uh, you know, uh, the regular case uh, still hold very well. And I think TKs are good to look at uh, if you want to see and you know look for posterior corneal astigmatism. But definitely, if you're using TKs, you can use it with the other formulas. But if you're using Barrett's, you should use it only with the Barrett's, uh, you know, uh, you know, TK formula, not with the regular Barrett's. Because uh, yes, I, I, I think okay, Naren. Uh, yes, Naren, you uh, wanted to uh, say. I to totally agree with uh, uh, Gaurasa. Actually, what. Uh, uh, the, the TK, we won't really, if you see average out the, all the patients and see the values and the results, actually, you won't see any benefit from it. But when it plays a role is when you look at the extreme ranges. 
or little abnormality that's when the tk uh, you know really uh, shines uh, over the regular k so i feel uh, that is why you know uh, people are not realizing the actual benefit of it because we are looking at you know the average or the larger number population of our uh, cataract patients and you compare that then you won't see the much much of the benefit so obviously when you are talking about a standard deviation it is the <coughs> people who form on the sides of the curve uh, that you are going to have a issue but i don't think at any particular time i feel that the tk uh, is giving an inferior result to having a proposed uh, keratometry in the bad uh, formula uh, i don't know uh, ram what would you wish to say is it in any way I, inferior I if we not. just go I sort of agree with you. You know, I think just for the sake of people who are not aware, what we are talking about is Barrett K formula, where the posterior condylar astigmatism is uh, assumed, mathematically assumed. assumed. Well, Barrett T K is where the posterior corneal corneal curvature is measured by the swepsos OCT. So you feed in both the anterior curvature and the posterior curvature, and whatever publication has come up as so far, and we had a Uh, meeting with uh, Dr. Douglas Cock also, he also said that there is hardly any difference between whether you measure the posterior corneal astigmatism or use a formula which assumes mathematically calculates the posterior corneal astigmatism. But very recently, uh, Barrett himself or Graham Barrett himself has come up with a paper which says that his results with Barrett T K is a little tighter with his mathematical assumption. So that's that's questionable. But I won't really. If you have an IOL Master Seven Hundred, if the TK upgrade is coming free to you, please go ahead and take it. But you really don't have to pay for it uh, just because <laughs> the ability is there. I mean, I think the Barrett formula, as such, the entire suit works very well. And the IOL Master Seven Hundred is a great instrument. I think Ram, uh, it was us who took it. Maybe two years, two and a half, three years. At that time, the TK was uh, possibly not a standard. But nowadays, when they sell the IOL Master Seven Hundred, TK is a standard in that. Uh, yeah, the, I, uh, Gaurav, I think uh, I recently saw that the keratometry uh, has been like the topography uh, has been uh, introduced. So there was a mail that came out from Zeiss that now they also have the topography uh, introduced in the IOL Master 700. So uh, sir, one question. Really, sorry, it's sorry. not really a placido, sir. They are not going to upgrade to a placido. What they are going to do is they are going to use the same points which are you know on the keratometer yeah. and derive the. placido like no. images but it will give us a great idea of you know the placido derived kind of an image yeah i am not saying that they have put up placidos i am just saying that now you can have a, a simulation of a topography my question to you people is that uh, yeah. uh, actually this question has come is the uh, era of eda of dead i personally feel you know the era of uh, most multi diffractive multifocals duoid multifocals eda of they are all great lenses we all use them at a point of time and then enjoy the good results so then um, obviously people want the vision at all distances so we go for a compromise so if you have something like a trifocal and now we are talking about trifocals with the concept of the bead off where the quality of vision is also taken care of so that might be a good synergy yeah uh, yeah narayan you want to say something Uh, so I, I mean, you know, I think it has. Uh, I, I personally believe it has its place in certain areas, uh, especially when you have uh, high order abrasions and uh, angle uh, angle alpha on the edge. When we have these borderline cases where, if if at all your cutoff is zero point six, now a little it's hovering around that range, or even high order abrasions, let's say zero point five seven or five eight, five nine. something like that so edofs are much more uh, you know uh, 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 patient accept it well or it does much better in these kind of uh, you know uh, borderline cases yeah but I most of us don't differ, measure i would like to differ narayan in the sense that yeah. you know if at all uh, there is a large angle kappa what mm. would determine the difference is the central mm. disc that you have and the central yeah. disc in the trifocal is bigger than in the edof lens And is absolutely, you know, somebody said 0.5 is the cutoff. We all accepted it. So if uh, let's say it's like the emperor's clothing. I mean, in the sense that you know, I personally have not found any. I do eye trace for all my patients, uh, but I have not found any correlation with patient satisfaction and angle alpha. I mean, I think uh, 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 that's a little overplay. Yes, actually, we have looked at the optical quality, sir. Uh, especially these uh, really borderline cases where we have gone for. 
Eat off and a few cases with the uh, uh, you know regular trifocal lenses with the same company, and we have found the optical quality actually a little better uh, in the eat off lenses in such uh, borderline cases of patients. You know, even the uh, not just uh, optically, even symptomatically, patients are doing much uh, much better. Sir. And subjectively, patients feel better. Yes, yes, definitely. Sir. They have oh, a, a very uh, only the the borderline. Definitely. The only question that was being asked is, see, there were two companies. I don't know about others, but there was uh, the J and J and Zeiss. Uh, both of them had the EDOF, and uh, both of them have now come up with the trifocal, and both of them have shifted their uh, uh, focus totally off. Uh, uh, well, I would say they have put their focus uh, totally onto the trifocals now. uh and that is because of the patient acceptability that is what i feel uh, because the dysphotopsia was the basic problem that was there a uh, dim light contrast was a, another problem and i think the trifocals have uh, taken care of that and intermediate was uh, sorry the near reading was always always an issue with an edof where you had to do either a mono vision uh, mini mono vision whatever you wish to call that and i personally feel with the coming in of the eye hands uh the uh, the intermediate part has been taken care of without uh, need and the pricing is uh, value for moment uh, today that i am not putting a monofocal and i am putting an eye hands because the cost difference is only about 2 3 4000 it's not uh, it's not major for me to talk about it to the patient Actually, there was a patient who had bilateral eye hands eropia for distance very happy and all that he needs is a plus 1.25 for uh, near uh, read so i personally uh, believe that my usage of uh, the uh, edof lenses have dropped almost to negligible vis-a-vis uh, 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 -vis in case i don't want to do anything or talking to the patient i can go in for uh, the i hands kind of a lens otherwise i am offering my patient strike focal without blinking a uh, blinking an eye uh, that uh, because earlier what i used to have a problem with uh, the bifocals i am not having with the trifocals i have not had to explant even a single trifocal i have not had uh, unhappy patients who have been eating my head and i have put them in young patients uh, without uh, any particular thing and from a value for money perspective uh i personally feel that the zeiss lens uh, with the minimal or no pco that is uh, from a value uh, perspective i still don't have the pricing on the synergy uh, as to what the pricing would be but uh, from a value perspective i think zeiss trifocal is uh, my most commonly used uh, intraocular lens i don't know rohit uh, would sir, you wish have, to predict me or agree sir i have stopped using uh, uh, edof lenses so i've shifted totally to trifocal because with this the level of satisfaction is much more with the uh, trifocals and that goes without saying and in those patients where you do not want any positive dysphotopsias by any mean so this eye hands is a very good adjunct and uh, i have practically shifted uh, more than 60% of my monofocal iols uh, to the edof ones uh, not edof eye hands eye hands eye hands right lenses among the panelists is anybody still putting bifocals bifocal iols uh, i i do it for patients bifocal. who really want good near vision you know with, with higher eyes year old who doesn't drive much who just wants to pick up his newspaper and read well you put a plus four diopter lens a higher it pleases them more than anything else makes sense very good very correct you know there's still a lot of people in our in our population who don't read their, look at computers who don't do anything else they just are bothered about uh, watching their tv walking around and looking at the newspapers for them just put a plus 4 diopter lens they do very well anyone wants to comment if a person has a bifocal say a plus 4 in one eye would you go ahead and do a trifocal in the other eye or would you want to do the same in the, that eye or whatever like what you had an earlier bifocal in one eye whether it was a plus 3 3.254 4, whatever it was uh, are you mixing and matching uh, mixing yes. uh, with the trifocals or, i have, uh, I have used trifocal in a few patients where the first eye was a bifocal and they've done extremely well so, okay so that you were nodding your head Yes, um, I have uh, tried the combinations of trifocal with bifocals also with EDOF lenses also, and most of the patients are always more comfortable with the trifocal. But there are, uh, you know, even last week I had done a similar case where the patient had had a symphony uh, a few years back, and again we put a trifocal lens, and I was expecting the patient to be much happier with this lens, and particularly common that near vision would be better. 
but somehow surprisingly even in the, the the refractive results and everything were equal in both the eye the patient did make this particular comment that he felt that the edof lens gave him a range of vision his exact motion was that from here to here i can see very clearly over here in in with the trifocal he very distinctly pointed out that it's clear here in clear here and in clear here but in between it 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 the symphony was doing better than the trifocal so i don't think we so can as, completely sort of shut the door on ear of lenses and no I mean, but the, the point is uh, the point is you are getting a combo now of uh, trifocal with ear of i think uh, that could uh, be the game changer also i don't know ram you have comments on that or uh, kk i never was fond of ear of lenses either way so i can't comment on it <laughs> <laughs> I think Edo. Kegi Sahab is very clear on the point. <laughs> I think you know Edo. Uh, yes, the quality of vision, but again, it uh, functioned on the basic principle of splitting of light, and we cannot say that there was no dysphotopsy of Edo lenses. They are great lenses. We implanted bilaterally and used to do a bit of monovision, micro monovision, and the ultimate results were good. But now we try to focus. That conversation is gone. Yeah. And as far as mixing and matching lenses is concerned, I think it's only limited by the surgeon's imagination and uh, what the the needs of the patient. There's nothing like I would combine a monofocal with a trifocal, ed off with a trifocal. I've done ed off toric lenses in one eye patient requiring plus one in the other eye. I put a tri ed off trifocal in the other eye. So I think there's uh, the concept that you have to put the same lenses in both eyes. But most often it's important if the patient is happy with the first time. If not happy, you have another technology will address your second uh, and bilaterally implant. If the patient is happier, go ahead and use it. Uh, there have been patients with uh, multifocal intraocular lens in one eye, complaining of a lot of dysphotopsia. I've gone ahead and put a monofocal in the uh, uh, second eye. Okay. Any things? Any, any other? Yeah, Gaurav, you have a comment. Yes, I wanted to comment on the fact that uh, rotational stability in the back seems to be great. Too, I'm using a good number of uh, trifocal torics, and I find that the lens uh, sits quite well. And you know, I've uh, you know, I had my concerns uh, to begin with, but I've realized that uh, you know, in fact, it it behaves much better than uh, the usual torics that we use on the hydrophobic platforms. And you know, it, where you leave it, it stays there even when you're like kind of washing out the viscoelastic and stuff. I've seen it sit quite well in the bag and in the post-op period as well. So, anybody else has any experience on this? I fully agree with you. I fully agree. Yeah, Narain, go ahead. Uh, yes, I, I, I mean, yeah, the main, uh, I feel the main uh, contribution why that stability is mainly the design of the lens because it's a plate haptics. It sits really well. Uh, wherever you stick it, it'll not move at all compared to the other. And uh, definitely, you know. uh what is very crucial is in all these toric patients please do not try to uh, forget to wash the viscoelastic below the lens because if you don't do that first you might have a little refractive surprise and there there is a chance that it might nudge the lens there in here oh, i think this is a important question i am not talking from experience the general consensus was that the modified c loop and other things are much more stable the plate haptic lenses you know rotation stability is not so great i mean uh, this seems to be an exception uh, i mean do you think this is a very good platform apart from the fact that it's hydrophilic with a surface hydrophobic stability of a rotation stability of these zeiss lenses all of you guys are quite convinced about it yeah. so we need to develop because of uh, like uh, other brand and uh, some indian lenses i used the rotation stability is not so good but only particular with this lens zeiss lens so we as you said that hydrophilic with hydrophobic surface that makes a sense and the rotation stability is really good with this lens sir i think rohit you were nodding your head sir taj was also nodding so regarding would... rotational stability i think rotational stability is definitely you know when you try to align it you find that there's uh, relatively more uh, effort which is required to rotate it so this and where it you leave it it stays there so i personally believe that contrary to my previous expectations about using such plate haptics uh, i find that somehow that stability is definitely there in these uh, you know toric iuls so i think uh, from a commercial standpoint uh, their offer which i think they have restarted of 55000 for two torex uh, and one uh, dusia is a steal and uh, we should <laughs> we should buy that because you don't get a trifocal torex at uh, 25000 
so i personally feel that uh, that is a uh, uh, pretty exciting from their point of view that they as people more and more will use it and maybe find less pco and find good but my pal you made it so it's with an exclusive offer and now you are announcing it no 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 this is not a no, toric is not an exclusive offer <laughs> toric is a, is an offer that uh, i think uh, i got a mail only day before yesterday it was till 15 september i think they have extended it i don't know uh, i think uh, you might have unsubscribed the mail that is something different but that is what it is so in any case uh, uh, i think uh, if there is any specific point otherwise we can wrap, wrap up because we are uh, going into uh, quarter past 9 okay uh, so thank you very much i think it was uh, really great uh, to have the uh, kind of uh, symposium on uh, the trifocal lenses and uh, i think uh, more and more people as was pointed out right from the beginning till the end are now adapting to the technology of trifocal which has taken away a lot of ifs and buts uh, in the earlier bifocal technology that was there and uh, i think uh, uh, i would uh, say that the patient deserves uh, the best that is possible uh, whether it is the toric platform whether it is the trifocal pat platform but uh, you need to have good pre operative evaluation and uh, uh, an accurate power calculation to reach your target so i wish to thank all of you thank uh, keki sartaj kudlu uh, uh, dr gaurav rohit uh, ramamurthy naren and uh, i think uh, shri ganesh left and uh, also namrata uh, for uh, having made this uh, topic very very interesting and i think there were a lot of questions and a lot of interest so thank you very much to uh, uh, zais and also i wish to thank uh, the uh mr sunil and tripal and uh, shiv kumar for helping us uh, in this uh, particular transmission i think without them the transmission doesn't go flawlessly and thank you very much uh, all of you and thank you to the delegates uh, for uh, having listened to this webinar thank you and uh, good night thank you sir thank you. Yeah.